Um, okay, so good morning. Welcome everybody. So I'm Deborah Dennis and I have the pleasure of chairing today's event. I say a pleasure, Donald's given us quite a challenge. Um, but I'm CEO of the Lucy Faithful Foundation, uh, which launched the Stop It Now helpline in 2002. And it is a privilege to be here today. Um, I'm going to start off with some housekeeping. So as just mentioned, today's conference will be recorded. So if anyone doesn't wish to be on there, do just turn your camera off and remove your display name. And perhaps Sam, you could pop that in the chat. So if we have some joiners, people are aware that, that we're recording. Um, that would be great. We're hoping today will be quite informal, really. So if you have questions, please, or thoughts or comments or observations, please do place them in the chat. And while the very tight agenda might not let us address all of those today, we will collate them all and respond after the event. Um, you may have noticed, it may not have gone unnoticed, that today's agenda is fairly busy. 17 speakers, no less, and two breakout rooms. And the truth is, I did tell Donald this was utterly bonkers, um, but anyone who knows Donald uh, knows he's nothing if not ambitious. So having asked all of our friends and colleagues to play a part in today and for them all to say yes, he just couldn't help himself. So he's given us a bit of a job um, to rattle through the agenda, but actually having a look at it, there's some a real cross section of topics and themes coming up. So hopefully um, everyone will find it incredibly insightful and useful. What this means is though, we haven't scheduled any breaks. So please just do take a break whenever you need to. Um, and because of the tight agenda, we've also included all our speakers' bios in the programme. So as we introduce people, we're not going to be giving them a full introduction. So please do just refer to the agenda to have a look and see who our speakers are. Um, Another thing for those on social media, we'll be using the hashtag StopItNow30 for anything shared in relation to the conference across social media. So please do go ahead and use that if you're active on those spaces. That's hashtag StopItNow30. And the final piece, um, to our two final bits of housekeeping really, we'll be running two breakout rooms. So when we go into those breakout rooms, we ask that one person be nominated just to take a couple of notes and then be prepared to enter two to three headline comments into the chat. We won't be taking verbal feedback from the rooms, but if we can get a couple of comments in the chat, that will then give us an opportunity to um, collate that after the event and then respond to and share some of the thoughts that came out of those breakout rooms. And finally, there will be a link in the chat requesting feedback, a bit of an evaluation for us at the end. So we'll be grateful if people can take the time to fill that in before you exit the conference, but we'll also circulate that afterwards as well. So um, if you don't get a chance to do that, we, we will send it out afterwards, but your feedback would be appreciated. So I think that covers all of the housekeeping -y bits for now. So um, I'm just going to I'm just going to make some opening remarks really about, you know, the friends and colleagues that we have on the call from around the world. You're all very, very welcome. We've got attendees from NGOs, statutory services, health, law enforcement, Acomedia and others. Um, and it, it was a delight to see the RSVPs coming in when we sent out the invites to this event because we didn't intend for it to be a sort of big, big conference with hundreds of people. We wanted, you know, some 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 select people. So consider yourself select if, if you choose um, to come together and have a look at the work, have a look at perpetrator prevention, have a look at Stop It Now. Um, so welcome, everybody. So in preparing for today, I, I started to think about what makes Stop It Now special. Um, and part of what makes Stop It Now special, of course, is its uniqueness and the very practical work that we do and projects around the world do and has been done for the last 30 years to protect children from sexual harm. But another part of what makes Stop It Now really special is the staff and the people who work tirelessly to deliver our really simple mission, which is to prevent the sexual abuse of children. And that cross cuts all of the work you're going to hear about today, all of the Stop It Now projects and all of our, our, our colleague perpetrator prevention projects as well, that we all have that very simple mission at our core. And that's really special, I think, as a group of people coming together um, who share, share that vision and that mission. Um, so I wanted to just recognise the staff, both those here in the UK um, and also those around the world, many of whom are with us today. 
And then I got to thinking about helplines more generally. And of course, helplines are a well-recognised way of supporting children with various difficulties, including child protection issues. But ultimately, we know that it is the responsibility of adults to protect children from harm. And we mustn't let children carry that burden themselves, which is why... Um, with the inspiration from Stop It Now USA in 2002, Donald secured funding from the Home Office to open the Stop It Now UK and Ireland helpline here in, here in the UK as a confidential space where adults can get support and advice if they're worried about their own or another adult's or young person's sexual thoughts, feelings or behaviour towards children. And it also supports parents, carers, professionals and survivors and, and has been doing for 20 years now. Like many other Stop It Now projects, we don't ask for identifying details so people can talk really openly about the help they need. And our skilled advisors who come from a range of different backgrounds, including police, probation, education, health, psychology and other helplines, do a really sterling job of, of working with our callers who, who often have very difficult circumstances and very challenging things they want to talk about. Um, here in the UK, uh, in our first year of the Stop It Now helpline, we took 640 calls across that first year. We're now taking 15,500 calls, emails and live chats um, made by nearly 8,000 people. So demand has grown and our helpline here in the UK has grown to meet it. Um, and we do still have missed callers. So in addition to picking up the phone, we also make resources available online. And you're going to hear about some of those today as well, I think. But the helpline itself is really core and fundamental um, to what we do. And I want to now tell you about one of the callers um, who has, has always comes to mind when I think about our helpline. And it's because it is the sto these stories, these, these case studies, if you like, about real people that make me so proud of the work of Stop It Now. So I'm just going to briefly reflect on, on one of our callers before I pass over uh, to Donald. But this is a caller, Jude, and he was age 27 when he called our Stop It Now helpline and he lived with his parents and his brother. He called the helpline concerned about his sexual thoughts towards his eight-year-old niece. And on several occasions, he told us he had felt aroused after playing with her. Jude told us he didn't have a sexual attraction to any other particular child, but he did admit to having a sexual interest in children more generally. He told us he hadn't accessed any indecent images of children online, but that he did view a large quantity of legal adult pornography, the content of which was becoming increasingly extreme, he said. He told us he was currently engaging in therapy with a counsellor, and although that related to generalised anxiety rather than his pornography use or his inappropriate sexual thoughts, he was feeling like he was getting some benefit from that. He was very anxious throughout the call as he was talking to our helpline advisor and he expressed great concern about hurting anyone and upsetting his family. So our advisor reassured Jude he had contacted the right place for confidential support, advice and information to help him address his inappropriate sexual thoughts. And we talked through with him the consequences for his niece, himself and his family if he was to act on those inappropriate thoughts. We discussed the importance of Jude implementing child protection measures, not having any unsupervised contact with his niece or any other children. And we explored the benefits and the pitfalls of him discussing what he was going through and how he was thinking and feeling with his family. And that whilst they may initially be shocked and upset, they would also be able to provide a level of supervision and support if they knew. We also talked to Jude about addressing his pornography use, recognising that if that was left unchecked, there was a risk that could escalate um, and there was potential for him to seek out illegal material if he continued to use pornography at the frequency and in the manner that he was currently. And we discussed some of the tools available to help limit or prevent his access to pornography. He was also encouraged to engage in active distraction and replacement activities in order to reduce his anxiety levels and his fixation on the inappropriate sexual thoughts he was having. And we discussed with him hobbies and possible adult groups he could join as well. In total, Jude was given seven actions to complete, including look at our, looking at some of our online self-help for people who are experiencing inappropriate sexual thoughts about children. That online help offers information and advice for people and helps them to cope with difficult emotions and to manage problematic thoughts. We also arranged for him to have a series of scheduled calls with a practitioner who specialises in the treatment of adult sexual abusers and potential abusers. And during these calls, Judith discussed his progress 
uh, and how he was getting on with the online support. He said he found those self-help modules that he had accessed helpful and he thought he was managing quite well, although he was still very anxious at times. He had followed some of our advice and he had discussed his inappropriate thoughts with his counsellor. He had also talked to one of his brothers and one of his sisters and they had been supportive and were encouraging him to focus on moving forward with his life in a positive way. Jude also told us how he had avoided visiting his niece and her family and had found his thoughts about her diminishing in the absence of contact. He had also started working on other aspects of his life. They had started taking driving lessons and seeing his adult friends more often. He had a part-time job and he was using a timesheet to plan his day. He said that structure assisted with him controlling his anxiety and reducing his thinking about his niece. And Jude continues to use the helpline today for ongoing support and advice and regularly calls to update staff on his progress. So I wanted to share that just as a bit of a backdrop to while we talk about calls and callers, that behind each of these is, 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 a, is a person, is a family, is a situation that, that, that we're working to make safer. Um, so I hope that sets the scene a little bit for today's event, which is all about preventing child sexual abuse before it happens. And with that, I will hand over to our first speaker, Donald, from Stop It Now UK and Ireland, who will tell us more about today's events and the theme of the day, and also hopefully give us a bit of an apology around the 17 speakers we have speaking and the challenging time frame we're going to be working to. So, Donald, I will pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, uh, very much. Uh, so, uh, I, and I'm uh, hopefully you'll bear with me a second while I uh, load some slides. That's probably not going to be a surprise to you. Uh, th this is my way of constraining myself and what I'm going to say. Uh, otherwise, goodness knows where we'd end up uh, over the 10 minutes of time uh, that, that I, I allocated to myself uh, for saying something. So look, first off, De De Deborah, thank you very much for your introductory comments and from bringing a person to us in the frame of, of, of Jude uh, and the circumstance that Jude was in and the very practical steps that were taken over a period of time to help him in that particular situation, hopefully to get his life on a very different track and make sure children with him were safer. Um, but and 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 today, um, bringing all, all that we're doing together is about celebrating all the work um, that that we're all doing on these screens uh, to prevent uh, sexual abuse of all kinds. Uh, yes, of course, uh, particularly to do with the sexual abuse of children, but the sexual abuse of adults uh, equally an important agenda. So happy birthday to us. Um, the Stop It Now projects um, uh, was part of the reason for bringing this 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 event together. Um, because we were launched in 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 2002, um, uh, and I spoke this morning on the radio to BBC Surrey because we were launched in Surrey in 2002. Um, it just felt we needed to say uh, happy birthday, and, and clearly, 30 years old Stop It Now US, uh, 20 years old Stop It Now UK. 10 years old, Stop It Now Netherlands, five years old, Stop It Now uh, Flanders, um, Stop It Now Australia, Stop It Now Brussels, uh, uh, kind of kind of were kicked off uh, in, in this very year, 2022. Um, and goodness knows uh, where we're going. I know there's some exciting developments in Switzerland that we're going to hear about. So it's partly to say happy birthday. But it, and in saying happy birthday, um, we have the tremendous benefit of, of having uh, Sue and Nadine from University of the Sunshine Coast, who, who, who have done some research over a significant period of time to collect um, some comments and some evidence about um, the work of Stop It Now's globally in order to reflect on uh, that practice, which um, is, the, 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 is, is an event that will, that will hopefully um, arm us for not only our journey uh, over the, the years ahead, um, in terms of, imp of asking some of the questions, creating some of the answers, uh, creating some greater momentum uh, and increasing collaboration um, across the Stop It Now projects, yes, but of course across other projects too. And, in thinking of today's event um, and having been in contact with so many of you on the screen, with so many of the projects that are working to tackle sexual violence of all kinds in all parts of the world, it seemed important that Stop It Now is celebrating, but so should we all be celebrating the work we're doing 
and the collaboration, hopefully, that we can achieve uh, in, in, in strengthening forms over the months and the years ahead. So today was about all those things. And, and who's here? Well, you, you've seen the agenda and the speakers, um, but there are also co colleague collaborators uh, and people from this very project. But as Deborah said, um, some kind of government departments, some funding organisations, some other NGOs interested in this theme, organisations working with survivors of, of, of child sexual abuse. Um, so a, a myriad of people. And as Deborah was going through the case example uh, of Jude, the person of Jude that called the helpline. Um, I guess for me, that is one inspiration to talk to all of you to say, look, what's important today? What are we hoping to achieve? Not is beyond the celebration, is what ha what is happening next? What is happening next? What are you going to do next? And every caller to the Stop It Now helpline uh, is asked to agree one or more actions. Now, I may not be agreeing with all 70, 80, 90 people on these screens, um, what actions that you will take. But I guess I hope at the end of today, uh, you will agree one or more actions that you will take that will take forward this agenda of sexual abuse prevention um, uh, uh, and contribute in whatever way you feel is best for you. And if we can be collaborating over that, that will be fantastic. Um, so it's what happens next that is the vital thing. Reflecting back on Stop It Now UK uh, and Ireland uh, and the context that I work in, the, the, my front screen with 20 years uh, w w was important to acknowledge the logo of the organisation uh, that, that I, w I'm, we're part of, the Lucy Faithful Foundation, which is also 30 years old this year. Um, the, the, the Stop It Now benefits enormously here in the UK and Ireland from being part of the Lucy Faithful Foundation um, b b because we are the helpline that is involved in secondary and tertiary prevention using this public health framework um, of child sexual abuse prevention. So we're the helpline involved in, in, in secondary and tertiary prevention, working with those who represent the risk, but also working with the families and communities that sit around the risk or the person who represents the risk, who are concerned about the possibility of abuse. Um, so we work, that's what we do. But the wider Lucy Faithful Foundation does a myriad of other things as well. It does assessment and interventions with those who are convicted or, or, or considered to be at risk. But it also does primary prevention work, sometimes in schools, whether that's to do with online risks, delivering programmes for to kids or to parents. We have our Parents Protect website. So the primary prevention work informs what we do on the helpline and we, in our turn, inform back. Um, the, the tertiary prevention work that our colleagues in Lucy Faithful do inform what we do, but equally we inform them back. So, so there is a tremendous benefit that I believe that here in the UK and Ireland we derive from being part of this wider Lucy Faithful Foundation. Uh, and, and, and I guess that's something to reflect on because I know that's not that that every Stop It Now project across the globe uh, is in a different set of circumstances you'll hear about shortly. Now, with time ticking on, I just I know I need to, to reflect on a, a couple of things that just were important that I wanted you to be thoughtful about as we go through today. The issue of the comp the, 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 the issue of the scale of child sex abuse, yes, but also the who's doing it. And this the diagnosis of paedophilia will will relate to a proportion of those people but not even the majority of them. So child sex offences are committed by many people who are not diagnosable as paedophiles. So what does that tell us? And where does the prevention story need to take that? Um, the, yes, what's the contrast between child sex abuse offenders, uh, images offenders um, on, online, but also contact uh, sexual offenders? So how do those things relate to each other? By the way, here in the UK, whilst today I'll use CSAM, um, as the kind of as the abbreviation um, in our public communications, we talk about uh, the users of sexual images of children just because Stop It Now needs to make sense to the public. We can talk to our professional colleagues till the cows come home. The public needs to understand who we are. The public needs to understand the issues and the risks. The public needs to be part of this, that solution. And that's what the various helplines are trying to achieve. Um, what's the difference between CSAM offenders in the open web and CSAM offenders on the dark web? And, and, and I do think these are material differences that we need to be understanding and exploring. And then when it comes to if we engage with those people, 
how much work do we need to do with them? What do, is the right dose for the different kinds of offenders that we might variously be dealing with? For some, I believe, genuinely believe, a warning will be sufficient. And that's why our warnings that, that we're, many of us on the screen are serving through the kind of mind geek, the porn hubs of this world. Those warnings, I think, will be sufficient to derail someone from a journey they may be just about starting on. But those warnings will not be sufficient for others. Um, we also need to be cautious about the dangers of over-treating people, um, of making, making more of a problem than they may already have. So there are just some cautions we need to be thinking about. Um, we're going to hear, I'm very excited that uh, Christopher Rahm from the Karolinska Institute will be speaking very shortly um, about, the, about the interventions that the, uh, the randomised control trial that they've just been running in the, uh, in the Karolinska Institute. Again, about online interventions, um, but how, how, how are they, what's the utility of those online interventions coupled with, um, with, a, with a, a, an intervener, a therapist, a psychotherapist or whoever it may be, What's the benefit of those compared with face-to-face -face in, uh, intervention? But also, what about online interventions themselves, independent of any worker? Do, uh, do they serve a purpose? I hope they do. I believe from the feedback we get, they do, uh, because that is one primary way that we're contributing to the prevention of child sexual abuse here in the UK, but also globally. We need to be thinking about the scale. I mean, the, the, the problem of child sexual abuse, we know, has been vast. Uh, continues to be vast and whatever difference we make um, is, is at the moment is a small part of that vastness and we need to then scale up and our interventions are and our messaging and our services need to scale up to match that 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 need and that demand what is the impact of legal pornography you just heard the story of Jude uh, from from Deborah what, what we're, we're grappling with variously of us um, uh, about the issue of legal pornography use and whether that serves as one pathway into offending. Does it serve as one pathway into offending uh, or is it used as an excuse by some of those who are detected for, uh, for offending, CSAM offending potentially? Is that an excuse or is that actually the pathway that they followed? Uh, and we need to understand that. There is so much work research work needed in that issue of pathways and that pathways not just by interviewing offenders but by deconstructing the technology that is seized so that we have some 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 cross-checking of the veracity of the stories that we may be being told and what are the pathways out of offending um, we really need to be offer the hope and I, I attended a conference with stop it now us uh, a, a, a couple of weeks back now and that was very much the theme of their of their event was about the bringing bringers of hope offering hope to people who contact us offering offering hope to communities offering hope to children that change and that good lives are all possible Donald, you did ask me to give you a time check, so this is your time check. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that, yeah, thank you, Deborah. Um, well, and that, that's quite uh, opposite, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, th thank you all for attending and as uh, uh, and, and Deborah for chairing. Thank you for the work you all do. And, and as Deborah has already said, I, I thank you to the, the, the colleagues that organise this event. I, I'm a chaotic person to work alongside. You may have already gathered that, uh, but I've been supported by many colleagues uh, that, that are, are behind the scenes or on screen right now. Um, but also thank you to the six, seven, eight of my Stop It Now advisor colleagues who will be taking calls as we're having this conference. And by the end of our conference, I will expect we'll have dealt with 30 or 40 different people in different circumstances here in the UK and Ireland who are all playing their part in keeping children safe from sexual abuse. So that's me done for now um, uh, and, and I kind of look forward to participating in the rest of the day and look forward to the, 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 the chats that I'm going to be starting to visit anytime soon. So uh, thanks, Deborah. Handing back to you. Lovely. Thank you, Donald. Um, so up next, I'm just going to give Donald a second to stop screen share. We have Nadine and Susan from the University of the Sunshine Coast who are going to take us through looking back to move forwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me start with a happy birthday to, to stop it now. I'm uh, Sue and I'm here with my colleague Nadine coming to you from, uh, from Australia. Nadine's just putting up some slides for us to talk to you about. 
Let me say we are both absolutely humbled to be presenting with you uh, today to present the findings of the research that we have undertaken with the support of the Oak Foundation. We're going to provide a brief overview of the project. We're going to talk about sort of finding headlines, the key findings of the project, and importantly, talk to you about, I guess, the discussion points that we think have emerged from this research, sharing those with you really as a platform to pro prompt further discussion during this event in your breakout sessions and also onwards and after, after this event. While I'm speaking, Nadine's going to put a link into the chat to the report that we wrote of the research for those who are interested to read that in more detail. Obviously, we'll just be touching on headlines uh, today. Before, I, before we start, though, I would like to do some acknowledgements and we'll do those fairly quickly for you. Importantly, we're coming to you from Australia and it's important for us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we live and work. And I live and work on uh, Yuggera lands, Nadine lives and works on Gubby Gubby Cubby Cubby lands. And so we pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past, present and emerging. And it's a really important acknowledgement for us before we begin, because First Nations Australians are disproportionately impacted by child sexual abuse. And so with the acknowledgement, this is an affirmation and a commitment to contributing to the safety of all children. We would like to acknowledge Jenny Coleman, Donald Findlater, Stuart Allardyce and Joan Tabachnik for partnering with us on this very important project and importantly for trusting us with this very important task and acknowledge the Oak Foundation for funding. We were also assisted by our wonderful research team, Melissa Bartels, Lyric Buzzer and Amanda Robertson, who assisted with data collection and analysis. And in line with Deborah and Donald, I just want to add our acknowledgement as well to the incredible array of people who've been part of this 30 year journey. The commitment and dedication and passion is admirable and inspirational. And it's evident from the findings of the research we're talking to you about how much work and progress has been made across the various Stop It Now sites across nations, a testament really to the dedication that we all have to making the world a safer place for children. So I'm gonna just talk you through the project uh, very briefly to allow more time on findings and those discussion points. So we were asked to consolidate this 30 year history of this amazing movement. And of course that took us to key achievements or main achievements of which there were many, but also a real a focus on the factors that contributed, that challenged, that facilitated this expansion, this development, this growth and progression over time the factors that shaped its development. Findings were drawn from the experiences and shared wisdom of a range of professional stakeholders across the eight jurisdictions in which Stop It Now was implemented at the time. So that included the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, uh, also from Ireland, Netherlands, Belgium, and Australia. So 20 professionals in all contributed to the study. These, uh, these stakeholders either had historic involvement uh, with Stop It Now or current involvement or both and included key leaders of this movement as well as frontline staff. We undertook then an integrated qualitative analysis of those stakeholder interviews and also of the many documents that were provided to us by those participants and that we sourced ourselves to bring that together and to collate all of that information to explore cultural and contextual values, attitudes, beliefs, government policies, funding opportunities, all of which together impacted the development and implementation of the Stop It Now movement. Importantly for this event, proposed areas for future consideration and discussion questions were derived from the study. And we really wanna focus on those in this presentation because we think they provide a really important platform from which to share and to plan for the future directions of Stop It Now. 
Uh, so that's the project in a nutshell. I'm now going to pass over to Nadine, uh, who's going to take you through the key findings of the study. Thanks, Sue. So we will share in brief with you uh, the headlines from the project. And as we mentioned earlier, you can read the details uh, via the report in the link we've provided. But just in terms of what's in front of you here, um, those three top uh, boxes talk to the areas or the headlines we're going to cover today. And then there's the blue uh, boxes underneath are the major overarching uh, themes that were uh, emerged from the uh, qualitative analysis and the orange ones are some of the sub themes that uh, underpin those. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, factors shaping development. Now, having champions at the forefront of the initiative were deemed vital to securing support uh, to establish Stop It Now um, across jurisdictions. And certainly the existing knowledge, reputation and track record of the organisation or person who's at the helm of Stop It Now really provided a credible platform from which to obtain trust and buy-in from potential funders. Interagency networking and collaboration was deemed fundamental to garnering support, uh, with newer startups particularly relying on support from Stop It Now colleagues in existing jurisdictions to really guide their planning and implementation in those new locations. And this really lay, laid the groundwork uh, to generate local support um, uh, for new operations in these locations. Now, strong marketing strategies and clear messaging regarding Stop It Now's mission were identified as important drivers for the development and success. Uh, particularly those diverse and uh, tailored prevention messaging was a real key mechanism in terms of engaging intended audiences, so that the users of the service, and for influencing community sentiments about the value of Stop It Now and more broadly perpetration and prevention. Certainly hearing from individuals with lived experience uh, was uh, an important really for instilling that general community support for its operation and in turn influencing uh, funding bodies. Now, we heard about its uniqueness earlier. Um, so unique in its approach, it really provided clear evidence that people who have offended or might potentially offend do in fact seek, seek help that change is possible and that child sexual abuse is preventable. By consequence, it also filled a service gap that continues to attract demand um, you know, and across the world. Importantly though, um, through its work, Stop It Now has brought recognition to the fact that many of those who commit child sexual abuse are adults, adolescents, and even children that we know and love, and providing a platform to seek free, anonymous and confidential help and support. In terms of viability, um, the development and expansion of Stop It Now, of the Stop It Now movement has not been without its challenges and, and Donald spoke very briefly to those before. Um, most, uh, foremost, a lack of political appetite for perpetration focused prevention and hence stable funding was identified as a major constraint affecting uh, the sustainability and growth of Stop It Now. But as Donald mentioned, this was for some sites more than others. And this was oftentimes by interviewees um, attributed to the yuck factor, so that aberrance or that stigma associated with individuals who perpetrate child sexual abuse. And that, and that sort of led to a disregard for services that support these people. And this was despite Stop It Now's very early uh, directed and clear messaging of um, its shared community objective towards child safety and wellbeing. Although funding constraints had differential impacts um, on respective Stop It Now sites, it was common for all jurisdictions to report having, having to actively source funding to ensure its viability um, and, and particularly over the longer term. And uh, one of the other things that uh, was raised by a number of interviewees was the difficulties in quantifying the impact that Stop It Now has had and how that has impacted on funding opportunities. And that's likely a constraint that will um, likely to remain moving forward. Uh, so some things to think about um, when we come to areas for future direction. 
But that said, there has been many achievements. And whilst there's only two boxes on your screen in front of you, these are uh, significant achievements and, and um, cover off on, on large scope. Now, the first one is, you know, around um, perpetration prevention and putting that on the map. So adopting that public health approach from the outset, Stop It Now really managed to put perpetration prevention on the map adding a crucial piece to the child sexual abuse prevention jigsaw and leading charge of placing responsibility and accountability of child sexual abuse prevention squarely on the shoulders of adults. It offered hope and practical solutions. I think uh, Donald mentioned um, Jenny talking about that recently uh, to those concerned about theirs or others thoughts and behaviour. And as an upstream approach, Stop It Now um, has, through its active campaigning, increased recognition of the importance of early intervention and, importantly, prevention-focused uh, intervention and support to forestall child sexual abuse. Indeed, until Stop It Now was established, initiatives to address and respond to child sexual abuse uh, were made only available after a child was harmed. So groundbreaking at its time, uh, 30 years ago now, this innovative thinking and practice has positioned Stop It Now as a major player in child sexual abuse po uh, policy and prevention practice in both its respective um, jurisdictions and internationally. It has certainly shifted the perspective that child sexual abuse is inevitable, it is moved it from the perspective that it is inevitable to that it is preventable. Um, user engagement, I think Deborah mentioned this as well, for the most part has continued on uh, an upward trajectory and the number of linked interventions, um, so let's talk, get help, inform plus, um, upstream or what's okay or just uh, a small example of, of those interve linked interventions has really um, increased substantially, particularly in Europe um, with an uptake of these projects also indicating uh, quite high community need and demand uh, for such resources. And these spin-off projects um, that have often been funded locally um, and have helped to really augment the Stop It Now helpline um, and its viability over time. The other thing that became uh, quite evident uh, in interviews was the adaptability and the responsiveness of Stop It Now um, as, a, as critical to achieving its intended outcomes. And this was in part in a response to the emergence of new problems like online sexual offending that forced uh, innovative thinking and solutions. However, it was also connected to increased recognition of the need to expand communication channels to um, engage intended but very diverse audiences. So creating ways um, for the community, community to access information and support. Um, so things like the helpline chat, the email services and text functions, online self-paced um, help resources, training videos, uh, resource guides, bilingual resources, um, really have um, produced multiple pathways for users to engage in Stop It Now. And over time and with growing recognition of young people's engagement in offline and online sexual harm, uh, the remit of Stop, Stop It Now has become more focused on young people as one of their primary target audiences and potential users of the service. Now, in terms of those future directions, um, the importance of maintaining and promoting this public health approach to child sexual abuse prevention as a foundational aspect of Stop It Now um, was deemed critical moving forward. The learnings from other jurisdictions to inform the introduction of Stop It Now in new locations was also highlighted as important for improving the chances of successful establishment and scaling up of the Stop It Now movement internationally. But also it raised key questions uh, about Stop It Now's um, identity moving forward. And so we want to spend the rest of uh, this presentation really looking at some of these key considerations um, for uh, the future of Stop It Now. So I'm going to start with ownership and governance. Now, in terms of identity, uh, findings suggest the need for a clearer understanding of agreement um, and agreement of ownership and governance of the Stop It Now brand and its messaging. This comes at a crucial time when other jurisdictions internationally are planning to implement Stop It Now. 
and whether clear attribution and ownership is necessary, how this might operate and be governed moving forward are timely conversations that the people within the room need to be having. Concerns about protecting the brand and its principles and keeping Stop It Now separate from other prevention efforts was raised in interviews. The question remains as to whether Stop It Now is a brand in and of itself and whether its messaging is unique to that brand. Certainly the Stop It Now name and its reputation has been absolutely key to successful startups in other jurisdictions by creating a very niche service and filling a service gap. So such decisions uh, lead to subsequent questions regarding who owns Stop It Now and the Stop It Now brand and what the governance structure should look like, including whether there is one organisation at the helm or whether a consortium could be established to oversee current and future expanded operations. Currently, there appears to be no clear cut guidelines, policies or procedures that preclude startups in any country. This leaves Stop It Now brand, and its brand vulnerable to potential messaging and projects that may not be aligned with the Stop It Now values, mission and objectives. And currently there are regular, albeit sort of form, informal meetings taking place between in, uh, Stop It Now uh, managers internationally. However, fostering those stronger collaborations and establishing more formal partnerships um, could be uh, help to mitigate some of those uh, risks um, and help oversee the operation of respective uh, Stop It Now initiatives. Uh, the issue of intellectual property and copyright becomes important when sharing resources for adoption or adaptation in different jurisdictions. Um, and related to this issue is questions about financial arrangements for use of these resources and licensing and commercialization. Indeed, such strategies would help to finance a helpline and associated Stop It Now projects to augment, uh, augment some of those intermittent project-based funding arrangements. Um, the continued operation and growth of Stop It Now is dependent in many ways on securing a strong foothold um, on funding to meet the current and, and anticipated increased demand on uh, Stop It Now. Without question, um, one of the largest constraints faced by Stop It Now jurisdiction projects in all jurisdictions uh, has been the ability to secure that ongoing stable funding. And interview findings really indicated that respective jurisdictions were differentially affected uh, by funding availability in those jurisdictions. Uh, as Donald was talking about with regards to uh, Lucy Faithful, findings um, did highlight that momentum was facilitated through availability um, of stable funding where, where available. Uh, and this enabled greater presence um, of Stop It Now to gain and su sustain the traction they were having and in turn to increase user uptake. So it's really timely to engage in strategic discussions among stakeholders on ways to improve stability of funding and potential sources of financial support and to consider some of those additional self-sustainable funding um, sources, such as the, um, some financial arrangements or com commercialization of uh, resources or training. Uh, from its inception, Stop It Now also has operated in a niche market. Um, it's, it is important that Stop It Now retains its role as a leader in the delivery, particularly of perpetration focused prevention, with the helpline separate uh, from, but as a conduit to primary, secondary and tertiary prevention efforts. Um, Stop It Now must remain responsive to diversity and have the capacity to adapt to new knowledge and new responses uh, to child sexual abuse perpetration to retain its hold on the market. It is now time to consider how some of the spin-off projects that have, been, have augmented the original Stop It, um, helpline, Stop it Now helpline and new resources can be expanded to advance the Stop It Now movement overall. Uh, the Stop It Now name, uh, as we all know, is well established in several developed countries and the achievements to date can be built upon to step up operations within and across jurisdic jurisdictions to extend um, its reach globally. But expanding Stop It Now into more diverse regions of the world will require greater attention uh, to local adaptation, which in turn may further challenging branding issues. 
So questions including um, include how Stop It Now resources and services will attend to uh, diverse languages, uh, differing cultural values, legal frameworks, political agendas, community sentiment, and resource capacity. Uh, so for example, access to internet or phones to reach the helpline. Nations in the developing world may also face greater funding and infrastructure uh, challenges uh, than elsewhere. But regardless, new startups will be reliant on learnings identified from this project to pave the way for smooth induction and implementation. And finally on this one, um, Stop It Now was originally designed to target adults in the community, but I've mentioned before increasingly resources and projects have targeted young people engaging in harmful sexual behaviour. And this raises questions again about whether Stop It Now, Now's target audience um, has changed or widened, should I say, to include young people as a primary focus of Stop It Now alongside adults and what this means for its original objective and the program logic underpinning its operations. And then finally, the other area of consideration that um, became evident through the interviews was building um, an evidence base. And most stakeholders had reflected on missed opportunities and difficulties faced to engage more systematic research and evaluation activities to assess the implementation and impact of Stop It Now in respective jurisdictions. Hence, sort of embedding um, research and evaluation um, into Stop It Now operations will be important moving forward to support and extend the current evidence base underpinning perpetration focused prevention and to assess uh, the impact, its impact on child sexual abuse prevention. Action planning for longer term, uh, for a longer term overarching research and evaluation program that incorporates jurisdictional and international stakeholder collaboration and comparative analysis is suggested. Not least such a program of research will help to generate new knowledge um, that can be used to inform and enhance policy and practice to impact positively on child safety. Evaluation findings from an established longitudinal program can also build on the current evidence base, which is necessary to generate future funding and highlights the value of the initiative to retain community trust and for some uptake of the program. This will be beneficial also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for future startups so that they can leverage this evidence in seed funding proposals. Partnerships with universities or centres and institutes to enable cross-sectional and longitudinal data collection and analysis would be beneficial. Investment in externally funded research collaborations, we believe will be an important pursuit to ensure independence and impartiality in those evaluations, both in the short and the longer term. And any comprehensive investment in research and evaluation necessitates the development of clear data management protocols within and across the Stop It Now science. And finally, a um, comprehensive dissemination strategy that involves academic and practice outlets is also important to sharing the practice learnings and showcasing the impacts of Stop It Now uh, and that, how that is uh, impacting locally and internationally. Um, other key dissemination strategies to enhance Stop It Now's presence may be supplemented with annual international planning meetings and symposiums to continue to share the innovations and inform future planning and directions to amplify the Stop It Now movement. Now, these questions are posed in our final report. And as Sue mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, they can be used as a platform to really drive some of these collaborative discussions moving forward, um, to unpack some of the complexities, but also the potential opportunities um, to collaborate, to connect and to grow uh, the Stop It Now movement um, into the future. And so on that note, and I have no idea if I've gone over time or under time, but I'm going to pass back to uh, Deborah for any um, <laughs> reflections. Nadine, you are bang on time. Um, so thank <laughs> you very much. That's quite impressive. Donald, take note. Um, 
<laughs> but thank you. Yeah. So reflections on that. Well, first up, just thank you so much to yourself and Sue for all the work you did on this report. Um, and also thank you to Oak for their support in, in, in making it happen. We have for a long time wanted to take stock of Stop It Now um, globally, where, where we came from, how we all got there and where we might go. And I think your report provides a real opportunity, as you say, to look at what might really drive things forward going forward and we know there are some challenges in all of that of course there is and you've you've highlighted many of them um but working together i think is really really critical uh for the stop it now projects um so thank you so much for for doing the report for talking about it today um and for putting the link into the chat and i hope everyone gets a chance to to have a little look at that that's that's fantastic donald did you want to add anything to that before we actually move on to inputs from the project so I think Nadine your, your introduction there was was really great because now we're going to hear from from the Stop It Now family. Um, Donald is there anything you wanted to add before we move on? Thanks Deborah. Uh, look only that, I, I, that that we're about to get into the nuts and bolts of some specific projects as you just said um, but important that all delegates uh, hang on to the key themes that um, that Nadine and Sue have just spoken to, because that will be part of the conversation that we would really desperately want people to be having uh, in the breakout rooms that they that they'll eventually go to. But um, but yeah, but as you said, the, thanks to Nadine and Sue for com a really complex kind of piece of work bringing together disparate pieces of information and interviews into some really helpful uh, kind of steerage for us. Well, acknowledge, acknowledgement of the history, yes, but also of the challenges we need to face. And uh, and those are the discussion about those challenges are things that the, the various Stop It Now projects will be having. Um, we, we need to create time within our respective national agendas in order to have these international discussions to say how we're going to take the whole movement forward called Stop It Now. Um, and, and so, yeah, so you've, you've set us uh, some, some challenges for the year ahead, but um, excited that we'll be grappling with those shortly. So thank you. Thanks, Donald. And thanks again, Nadine and Sue. Um, right, we're going to cross now to Jenny over at Stop It Now. No, US. we're not. Oh, we're not. Sorry. We're not. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no apologies, Deborah. Uh, I, I, I know the agendas had just slightly shifted because we've heard from Christopher Rahm um, that, uh, that that Christopher um, from the Karolinska Institute um, uh, uh, that that he's currently left Sweden. He's he's got got a, a visit that he's undertaking in Italy, and I believe this was the window of time that that he'd agreed that he could make. To present at, at our event. So, um, and as colleagues may know, that there was a very recently published uh, randomised control trial um, that from the Karolinska Institute about uh, an intervention that's very pertinent to what we're talking about. So, we'd agreed before we get to the Stop It Now project, in, starting with Jenny from the US, that we that we'd lay here for, from Christopher for ten minutes uh, about that particular project and. The future that, that they're looking for as well. So apologies, Deborah, that you weren't notified of that. So hopefully Christopher is with us. I can see him. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, nice to meet you all, and thank you for um, making time for me this part of the program. Uh, I sent some slides uh, yesterday. Is it possible to sh to share them so I can have that as a background when I speak? Or would you like me to share the slides on my side? Oh, you could, you could share them. I'd be very grateful. OK. Wait one second. Hmm. Let's see. Have okay, you got ready access? Or do you, is it going to be helpful if we did it? for you, Christopher. Um, ah, okay, excellent. Can you see it now? Yes. Should I make it in a presentation mode also? Please. Um, is it okay now? Not yet, We've still got the little tablets alongside. Okay. So I see it on the full screen on my side, but 
Well, we um, we can I can say it sufficiently. I hopefully others can. So, um, but th so that's that's it's fine. It's just not full screen for us at the moment. Okay. Well, then I I start and uh, let me see. Okay, so I would like to present to you uh, the research program I'm leading at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Uh, and uh, before I do that, I want to say happy birthday to Stop It Now for all your fantastic. Uh, uh, birthdays you're celebrating at the same time. I'm so glad to be invited to this uh, occasion. Um, my own research group, we were just uh, funded. We started in um, in February, so we are very young with the babies in this conference, maybe. But we have still we have some projects to that we have um, uh, completed. So I would like to share some of the results with you. Um, let me see. Do you see the second slide now? Uh, no. no research program. No, no. OK. If I do like that, maybe. Is that better? No. If no. you bear with me, I'm just going to try and find your slides. Francesca, can you help me, please? I can't find them in the folder. Donald, I think uh, that's uh, that me. We're on the second them. slide now. You're on second slide now. Okay, then I move on. So the aim of, of uh, our research program is to establish what I call a second wave of research. We know from not least your work that uh, if you put up a helpline, then people will call and um, that we have a chance to intervene in people's lives, both uh, potential uh, perpetrators, but also uh, uh, children at risk of being harmed and their near and dear ones. But what I think is a very important finding is that the actual interventions that are after that uh, presented to the people who seek our help have not been uh, evaluated with good scientific methods as effective. In the, so we, really, we don't really know whether our interventions actually reduce the number of children being harmed. Uh, so what I would like to establish is some good evidence-based practice on what to do when the people have arrived to our um, facilities. So, uh, and I would like to do that by using uh, classic methods from, from um, uh, psychiatric research, not least, and uh, to, to apply um, the highest standards of uh, scientific evaluations on the interventions we believe are effective. And I also would like to uh, see that they are safe for the participants from a patient's safety perspective, that they are not harmed by our interventions in any way, and also that they are scalable to reach out to, um, to um, people living uh, outside of the big cities or in countries where uh, no help is currently available. And I'm also interested in, in uh, uncovering the underlying mechanisms leading up to the, to the actual offense. So uh, we're studying uh, with brain, uh, with brain uh, imaging, we're studying neurocognitive models for uh, uh, perpetration and uh, the risk factors. We're also conducting randomized clinical trials and we're trying to use hard outcome measures such as actual children being harmed and also study tolerability from the patient's perspective. And we want to maximize the output of our interventions that we find are effective, uh, not only geographically but also technologically and to um, target the most important um, uh, risk group, uh, the high risk individuals. We try to apply child rights uh, based uh, work method and I'm working also with the so-called patient and public involvement strategy in which uh, we have uh, uh, close collaborations with uh, not only the law enforcement and prison and probation service but also with child rights experts and patients with lived experience from having um, pedophilia or from being from being uh, convicted to have all uh, voices at the table at the same time in order to find the most important research questions and also to have ethically sound uh, methods. I want to show two examples of uh, studies that we've done. Do you see the new slide now? Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, one treatment we've tested. It is a medicine. 
It is a so-called GnRH antagonist. It works by um, reducing the testosterone levels. Uh, in just one or two days, the testosterone levels are down at castration level after having this uh, injection. And the effect lasts for around three or four months. So uh, the patient doesn't need to motivate himself every morning to take a pill, for example, only one time or only four times a year. And then the effect lasts. So we conducted a blinded randomized control trial and we compared it to placebo. And we, we recruited our patients th through the Swedish helpline called Preventel. And uh, we followed the patients for three months and we evaluated the intervention uh, primarily based on a risk score for uh, dynamic, different dynamic uh, uh, risk factors. And uh, yeah, long story short, we found it to be very effective in reducing not least the hypersexuality uh, measurements, but also the, uh, in, the uh, sexual interest in children. Uh, we found it to be safe from a side effects perspective and also very tolerable from a patient's perspective. In uh, qualitative interviews with the participants, they appreciated the effect and they want, a majority wanted an, um, a new injection at the end of the uh, at the end of the trial, but only the ones who received, uh, or mostly the ones who received the the, um, uh, the active medicine. The ones who received the placebo were not interested in continuing. So we have a follow-up project uh, planned. Um, one is to, um, in collaboration with my colleagues at the Karolinska University Hospital, to evaluate another kind of medicine that are often being used in this context uh, called SSRI. In, that has a um, libido reducing effect that potentially can be effective for, for some patients with um, risk of hurting children. Um, and we're also planning for a new um, study in which we will uh, try to have not only a three month treatment, but actually a couple of year long treatment for um, and, and follow how many patients really, how patients um, uh, perceive this intervention when it goes on for more than a couple of months. And in that study, we also uh, plan to include hard outcome measures such as um, convictions. So these are some studies we think are very valuable to, to um, get to know our tools in the toolbox, in the psychiatric toolbox. Uh, another uh, study we've uh, done in our group uh, is the one Donald mentioned in the introduction. I hope you see the third slide now. It is a, a talk-based intervention uh, using uh, cognitive behavioral uh, therapy principles and um, we have uh, designed it uh, to be um, uh, or we, we try to tailor it to um, see some users um, persons who uh, uses uh, child sexual abuse material on a regular basis uh, and we designed it to be uh, available online and in an anonymous manner so you didn't have to show your identity uh, or even um, uh, revealing your contact details such as email or anything, or even your IP number. So it is um, it's a two months long anonymous online ICBT uh, uh, therapy. And that one we also tried to challenge in the, in the hardest way by randomizing participants either to this uh, therapy called Prevent It or to a psychological placebo in a blinded manner. And we recruited our participants in different darknet perpetrator forums. And they uh, were also followed up for one month after treatment. And the outcome measure we used was uh, the weekly viewing time of child sexual abuse material. That was the primary outcome measure, but we also studied how severe material they were using and uh, all kinds of other uh, behaviors related to interest in, sexual interest in children. And uh, happily enough, we found also this uh, intervention being effective. Uh, both groups, placebo and um, uh, therapy, um, reduced their use in child sexual abuse material and other related measures, but the uh, ICBT group uh, significantly more, uh, although a small effect size. 
Uh, it, we found it to be safe. There were no uh, major severe events during the participation. We had 160 people, so we think we have tested it on a quite large number of people and also tolerable. The, the participants really appreciated this intervention. Um, so uh, follow up projects to this, uh, uh, to this um, study uh, are already at place. Uh, one is uh, called Priority. It's an EU funded project uh, in a newly formed consortium uh, led by Professor Bricken in Germany, in which we have uh, translated the intervention to Swedish, German, Portuguese. And we uh, tested, we test this uh, in locally adapted versions uh, starting February next year. And we also have a new improved English version that uh, recruit patients globally that is already at, uh, recruiting patients since two weeks back. And uh, what we're trying to do in next step is to uh, scale it up and to see uh, if it is um, applicable in different uh, jurisdictions and in different languages and cultural contexts. And we also try to reach out to a wider target population, not only see some active see some users, but all people with uh, concerns about the sexual interest in children. Um, uh, based on this uh, therapy, we also have developed uh, an, another intervention, online intervention uh, called uh, Bridge, in which we try to um, motivate uh, people with high risk of committing child sexual abuse to um, leave their anonymous online existence and to uh, sign up for being patients, identified patients at uh, local services in their own home country. And um, that uh, intervention we will evaluate in a new uh, EU funded, um, quite large uh, project called uh, Bridge. Uh, we are six uh, different countries, EU countries collaborating in that one. Uh, it is led by uh, Karolinska, but it is also uh, partners from Finland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Spain, uh, Germany and Sweden. So we're six countries. So we try to uh, test this uh, new intervention in different countries and different uh, jurisdictions. And in that project, we also test a self-help program developed by our, Finnish, by our Finnish colleagues. So these are some examples of the kind of uh, studies we're doing in, in Stockholm. And uh, as you said in the previous presentation, I think the key onwards is to collaborate. And um, we need to um, to um, really, uh, it, I think these are so important um, research questions with so many risks involved. We need to uh, evaluate all of our good ideas with good scientific uh, standards and being able to leave the ones behind that are not actually effective and to only continue with the ones who are, that are actually effective. And um, uh, yeah, I think that is a key strategy onwards. So uh, this is not done uh, by me, <laughs> myself, of course, uh, a number of important collaborations and there are many people involved in this. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and um, this is the team in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I'm very grateful for you finding the time to come and speak to us today. Um, it sounds like you're incredibly busy, but also just to say thank you. It's fascinating work. And as you say, the collaboration is really important and supporting each other and the sector in what we're learning and how we're learning about things and then sharing um, sharing that across to do everything we can um, together is absolutely the way forward, I think, for all of us. Is there anything you wanted to reflect on, Donald, before we let Christopher go to his busy day? No, I, I, I look, I, I think there are connections that will crop up later on in our agenda, um, uh, including from one or two partners that, that Christopher has just uh, reflected on uh, in other parts of Europe. So, um, uh, but I, I do think it, uh, one of the when I, we were Christopher on the in the event in Czech Republic recently acknowledged that that the r relative involvement of of the health services um, makes a big difference uh, nation by nation as to whether health is a is a key partner or whether it's not. And I say this with Kenny Gibson um, from the N from the NHS England uh, here at this conference that that is a key partnership that we need to more strongly build um, and that frankly is is less 
less strong than we would wish it to be here in the UK. And I'm sure there are colleague projects elsewhere uh, that the insights from health, from psychiatry and psychology are vital components to introduce and include in our work. So yeah, thanks for saying that. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, have a good rest of your day if you need to leave us now. Um, so we are going to move now, I believe, unless Donald has another no, no, uh, don't keep going, keep going to, Austin, for me. Yeah, to um, the US. To our Stop It Now projects, and we're going to go first to Stop It Now USA and Jenny. Jenny, hello. Good morning. It's great to be here and happy birthday to us all, right? Um, I am hoping that I can pull this over and it'll work. I'm sorry, I don't know your platform. So, hmm, trying to share it. So please bear with me. Ah. And it is there, believe it or not. Looks uh, good, Jenny. Work? Well done. Yeah. All right. Well, it. thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm got just, I believe, ten minutes, and so I am gonna talk fast. But it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I know that Nadine and Susan did a lovely job talking about our history, but I just really wanted to acknowledge Fran Henry, who 30 years ago helped get us all going on thinking about what we can do for perpetration prevention. Um, we really understand that the work that we do is meeting people where they're at, and that is evident throughout all of our programs. We create these human-centered experiences that are personal, that are intimate, that are talking with people in the moment that they need help for themselves, for someone they care about, or in response to something that's already happened. Um, I'm going to go through each of our programs very quickly, um, and some of this is familiar to some of you, and I wanted to share a couple of our new projects. But, you know, we've... <laughs> I don't know how many of you are aware of this US movie, um, a league of, no, it's not a league of their own. It's a baseball movie where if you build it, they will come. And that's really what we have found with the helpline and our services. Now in the US, we are a pretty small operation. We are not 24 seven, although that certainly is the vision that, that I, I always aspire to, that we'd like to be available in the moment that someone has that courage and that motivation at whatever else it is that is um, moving them along this journey to pick up the phone or write an email or a chat and ask for help. So our helpline is right now available 36 hours a week. We have, um, it's covered by three part-time counselors as counselors do do some work in some other times and is supported by all of our other programs. You know, just some really quick findings that we've recognized and continue to track over the year that we are talking with folks with incredibly complicated situations. These are folks who know everybody involved from the adult or the youth who could be at risk of sexually harming a child or who already is harming a child to knowing the child who has been harmed, who has been victimized or as an adult, knowing um, the person that abused um, someone in their community and how do they address that. So it's never a linear uh, situation as folks are reaching out for help to our helpline. Most of the situations we um, encounter on our helpline here in the US is about um, situations in the home. And so while we know our media is filled with concerns in schools, in campuses, in camps, in um, other private youth serving organizations, we know that the earliest moment that folks can reach out for help and do is in that privacy of their home when early warning signs of behaviors and situation ri situational risks are first coming to their attention. Many of the folks that reach out to our helpline, this is the first time they've spoken out loud the concerns that they have and over half of the folks that reach out to us are in a position because they are either addressing their own behaviors, thoughts and feelings, or are in close relationship with someone who is showing warning signs. So they are in that position to um, be able to intervene. Now, over the years, we've certainly noticed, and um, this has already been brought up, that we need to, while we've been focused on the adult role we understand more and more about youth sexual behaviors. We understand that 
Um, these numbers are increasing. We understand the uh, developmental tasks of youth to explore who they are in sexual relationships. Um, and so hence, we uh, three years ago with World Childhood um, Foundation funding, we're able to pilot the What's Okay program, which is designed to reach youth 14 to 21 with the questions they have about concerning sexual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Not typically your normal healthy sexuality questions, although we're prepared to respond to those as well, but those questions that are more like, is it normal that I'm into X, Y, and Z? What do I do about this addiction? My friends tell me I'm crossing boundaries and lines. We um, prompted, uh, developed a website as well as added onto our Stop It Now helpline, the What's Okay helpline, and added texting availability for the youth. We added a youth advisory council to help guide us on the language and, and where our youth hanging out. And a big part of this project is exploring the messaging and advertising to reach youth to help motivate them as well to reach out for help. There is um, this QR code, which will uh, bring you all to the resources that we've been sharing for folks to build awareness and our infographics um, with our updated um, results. But I just do wanna let folks know, this is another situation where we really wondered if anybody would reach out and indeed youth are contacting us with questions galore about their behaviors online, about the legality of their behaviors, about age gap differences. They are identifying barriers in their life, such as I don't know where to go, I can't talk to my parents. We are hearing from youth who are specifically asking about um, the recognition uh, of their own um, sexual attraction towards younger children and what this means for the rest of their life and how there's help. The primary objective in this prog uh, project is the deterrence of uh, youth harmful sexual behaviors. We were um, granted a second year to pursue this project and have applied for a third year. And we're really excited about our opportunities to help influence conversation with experts and professionals about what we need to do to address these sexual behaviors outside of the legal system. Um, also want to let folks know about our public education resources because this is a huge part when we think about um, child sex abuse prevention from that public health lens, we know how important it is to make sure that folks have access to accurate um, and relevant information. So our online help center addresses this 360 view of child sex abuse prevention, focusing not only on perpetration prevention, but also helping folks in bystander roles have the language and the tools so that they can also speak up when they're seeing concerns. Our training and technical assistance is part of our sustainability model, you know, bringing the learnings that we have for 30 years of working live with people in their homes and in their communities, helping others then bring that information to the communities that they work in. We work primarily with youth serving organizations and just recently were um, awarded in um, combination with our researcher, the Center for Vi um, Violence Prevention Research Center, uh, a 1.5 million grant to study our training with USA Football. We have a contract with USA Football over the last couple of years and are training their youth volunteer coaches with warning signs and language and safety planning so that they can keep the youth athletes that they work with um, safe every year. So we're very excited to, as we've heard, the importance of um, what is the impact, measuring the impact, are we doing what we think we're doing and giving folks tools that they can successfully implement in their communities. We're so excited that we get a chance to actually look at that. Um, we also just consider as one of our buckets, our leadership and advocacy role, where we are serving as experts and leaders on a variety of national coalitions where we work with our international colleagues to keep perpetration prevention uh, at the forefront of discussions where often prevention can slide off as people get really stuck in, in the intervention. And we know how important intervention and recovery and responses, and we know that we need to keep perpetration prevention a part of these tables, um, legislatively, funding, um, and long-term planning. Just a quick look at our impact over the last um, 12 months. 
our um, helpline, while we certainly are in the U.S., we are smaller in terms of our reach because of some of the funding and capacity issues, but we are reaching about 2,000 folks that we responded to this year over our entire 30 years. We have um, worked with over 30,000 individuals on our helpline. Now we're hearing, seeing um, a million and a half folks visit our website every year. So we know that's another resource that folks are being able to take into their personal life and into their community to share. Um, and then our new program, our What's Okay program in its first year, we've had over 30,000 viewers, um, 30,000 users on our website. We've responded to nearly 300 uh, youth and young adults in the first um, less than a year's time, and we'll continue to grow that program as well. And just because it is important to end with hope, this is um, one of our, while as hard as it is to get um, measurements, one way is when people write us back. And so this is A, from the exchange at the start of the year. This person wrote into our What's Okay program. Uh, you may remember me from my situation where I recklessly showed my cousin how to touch my, himself. I've just turned 18. And with the help of your counsel and my family's support, I've made even more progress and now have made it a month without using pornographic material. Donald, I hope I did that in my 10 minutes. I think you do have an incredibly ambitious and exciting schedule, but I am so honored to join you all today. Thank you so much. And as always, we hope to hear from you if you have any questions or concerns. Oops, I sounded like I just got off a helpline call. I can't help myself. Take care, all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, you were you were right on time, in fact. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that you referenced there that really ring true. L listening and learning and how important that is to what we do. Um, and then also what we do with what we learn. So how we respond and react to the trends and the insights and the stories and what we hear and see every day, which then feeds into the work you're doing for young people, but also the public education and how important that is and how important that remains for communities and families to stay safe. So thank you very much for the whistle stop tour and I do recognize this is a whistle stop tour for everybody and you can't get into 10 minutes everything you might like so thank you very much and with that challenge then is um, Kelly from the Netherlands who's going to give us a whistle stop tour as well I believe. Hello everyone um, yeah so let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. I can, yes. <laughs> okay, is it a big screen or um, let me see? It's a little one at the moment. That's so, it, yeah. that's big. Yeah, lovely. Okay, great, yes. So, um, yeah, well, uh, it's uh, great uh, to uh, be here. So thank you for that. I'm also very excited to hear about the other Stop and Now projects and uh, the other interesting speakers. Um, but let me tell you something about Stop It Now in the Netherlands. So um, we are part of the Expertise Center of Online Child Sexual Abuse, uh, which originated in 1996, I believe, and it was then uh, called the Hotline. And then in 2012, in collaboration with Forensic Outpatient Center De Waag, uh, Stop It Now was uh, established. So that means that this year we are uh, we're having our 10 year anniversary as well. So on the, the infographic on the right, that are um, our contact moments um, in the last 10 years. So I want to share that with you as well. So, um, well, I'm not going to tell you too much about um, <laughs> stopping up because I think you already know a little bit. But of course, we are an anonymous helpline. And since this year, we also have a chat function available. So as you can see on the right, it's um, I think our total number of contacts uh, by the time the infographic was made was more than 4,000, which consisted mostly of uh, phone calls. Um, and when you look at our target groups, these are for about half um, the individuals with concerns about their own uh, sexual feelings or behavior towards minors. And within this group, um, about half are uh, viewers of CSAM or potential viewers, and also a significant amount of these individuals um, are potential offenders of child sexual abuse 
and only a minority are individuals with sexual feelings towards minors, but who do not act on their um, feelings. And I think, um, yeah, a quarter about individuals that contact Stop and Now are individuals that are concerned about the behaviors of someone else. So these are mostly um, partners, family members, friends, um, and about 10% are professionals. So these could be psychologists, uh, sexologists, who have clients who express uh, concerns about their behaviors and they contact us for information or uh, case advice. So there are several things that we can uh, offer these individuals for support and help. So I think about a third of the individuals contact Stop It Now uh, more than once. So sometimes we have regular calls with some of the individuals but we also have contact persons with forensic outpatient centers and sexologists uh, throughout the Netherlands. So when we talk to these individuals, we see what their needs are and whether they, um, they would need some specialized care. We also have the availability to offer anonymous calls to a practitioner from forensic outpatient center De Waag. We still work closely together with them and to give them an anonymous call with a psychologist, it would really help for them to uh, get in contact and um, well, this lowers the threshold for eventually also starting a treatment. And as you can see on the right, I think about um, the individuals with concerns about themselves, about half of them get a telephone appointment with a practitioner from the WAG, and 76% uh, of them actually call uh, the psychologist. Um, and then more than half of them eventually start treatment. So I think this is a, a large amount and that's really great. Um, and besides the, the referrals to specialized care, uh, we also have an online self-help program, which we translated and adapted from Stop Now UK. Um, and I think it has, I mean, it was live since 2019 and it has more than 30,000 visitors uh, since then. I think even more by now. And we're also developing um, a section for relatives of individuals who watch uh, CSAM so that they can also get some more information and we also offer support groups for relatives. So in these groups, we come together, um, share experiences, and it is about recognition, about receiving supports. Um, only not all individuals are able to come to a location where a support group is held. So that's why we also are working on a forum, which is also um, similar and based on the friends and family forum for Stop Now UK. So this is also a place that uh, relatives of individuals who watch CSAM or uh, potential child abusers, they can get information, they can ask questions and they can receive support from each other. Because we often find that these individuals have a very difficult time in talking to their uh, environment about this difficult subject, but they receive a lot of, um, they need a lot of support. Um, in collaboration with Stop Now Flanders, we also uh, created a manual how to start a conversation. So that's for individuals who are concerned about the behavior of someone. Um, and it's often very difficult to talk about this subject. So we wanted to give people some, um, some easy steps to follow. So how to start such a difficult conversation when you have concerns. Uh, and we also have a version for professionals. So in the case there is a client who expresses concerns. Um, and um, Besides that, I think what I want to share with you guys is also these last 10 years, we, we did have a little bit of trouble with uh, receiving some funding, um, but this year was kind of a turning point. Uh, we received a lot more funding from the Dutch government, but also other funds and donations as well. So we were, really, we were able to grow a lot as an organization, which is great. So when I got to work at Stop Now two years ago, I think we were with uh, three uh, colleagues. And now we are at 10 colleagues, so that's uh, quite a big change. So we also have a lot of more uh, time and um, uh, yeah, money available for doing more projects and campaigns. So we started doing um, campaigns uh, to reach a target group, so potential viewers of CSAM. We did that mostly on porn websites, but we also are targeting um, individuals that are online contacting children, so individuals who seek um, who are want to chat with minors and possibly also uh, meet them offline. 
And we do that using social media, using Snapchat, Meta and other platforms as well. So we can use uh, advertisements to create awareness about the subject and to offer help to individuals who need it. And besides that, we think that child sexual abuse is a societal problem and we also want to create more awareness in, uh, well, in the general public. So we're doing more awareness campaigns as well. And I think that's also what we do the more in, in the future. So besides um, doing more research to find out what works and what doesn't, uh, to be more evidence-based in our campaigns, to learn more about uh, the people that contact Stop and Now, um, also learn more about the younger uh, potential offenders. Uh, and we also want to collaborate with other uh, countries um, and organizations. So we also want to develop a program that's called Just Prevent. So that's also about, um, well, sharing knowledge, about sharing our experiences and resources so we can more work um, together and to learn from each other and make a contribution to the prevention of child sexual abuse. So I think I'm not sure what I'm doing with my time. I, I think I talk really fast, <laughs> but that's what I want to share with you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm just going to pick up on Donald's comment that he popped in the chat as well, that your your sort of stats around your users and your target audiences and the people actually coming through are really similar proportions to what we see here, um, which I find really interesting. And maybe that's partly because of the way we do promote ourselves or market ourselves and the way we do that. Um, but that was really interesting. Also, just delighted to hear about the growth um, that you've had from three people to 10 people. That's really good to see that expansion. Um, so really pleased to hear about that. And also, um, I'm already noting some of the sort of trends and themes for the day, but it seems sort of future work, future research, future collaborations is on sort of all of our agendas, which is also really, really welcome um, to, to be thinking about that partnership working going forward. So thank you very much, Kelly, um, for talking to us about Stop It Now Flanders. And uh, no, Netherlands. Next up, we have Charlotte from Flanders. Um, so Charlotte, welcome. All right, Let, that would be me. Thank you for introducing me. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. All right, this should work. Is it working? My computer is acting up, I fear. That looks it at the moment, not on presentation mode though. Yeah, hold on. There. Yes. Bingo. Perfect. Oof. <laughs> That's almost the most stressing part. Um, yes, well, it is. Hello everyone, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I am Charlotte, I work at Sopita Flanders, which is part of uh, Belgium the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. Uh, normally my colleague Minna uh, is the one presenting these, at these kinds of events, but she couldn't be here today, so I'm filling in for her. Uh, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of our inner workings. Um, well, the helpline was founded in 2017 um, as a collaboration between the University Forensic Center in Antwerp, where Minna works, and ITER, which is an outpatient treatment center for sexual offenders in Brussels. That's where I work. I'm on a juvenile team there. Um, the helpline was uh, founded in 2017 originally um, to offer help through telephone and email. Um, and because of a lot of our users are all, all also seeking online help, uh, we started offering uh, help by chat in June 2019. Um, how do, what, what does the helpline do? Uh, we provide, of course, free anonymous and confidential help uh, for anyone who is concerned about their own sexual feelings, thoughts or behavior towards minors um, or relatives or other people in their close environment who are concerned about someone they love. Um, aside from manning the helpline, we are also involved um, in research projects uh, surrounding the psych psychosocial well-being of minor attracted persons and we are researching help-seeking behavior in the target audience. Um, we are also 
um, trying to sensitize society um, in how prevents pre wow sorry um, in how to communicate and uh, by launching and involving uh, being involved in social media campaigns. Um, what do we do? Of course, we offer a listening ear. We try to advise people, offer support. Um, and when there is a need, we can orient them to more specialized treatments. Um, we can refer them to the specialized treatment centers in Flanders. Uh, I'm going to take you through some of our side projects. These are all in Dutch, um, but um, as Kelly also said, uh, we developed a Let's Talk manual for anyone who is concerned about the, the sexual uh, thoughts, behaviors or feelings uh, towards minors in their close environment. Um, this was originally developed for people who were concern about someone in their inner, inner circle. And then more recently, we applied it um, to professionals who are not specialized in talking about uh, sexual feelings or um, abuse or uh, just sexuality in general, uh, but are being confronted with clients who are presenting themselves with uh, concerns or problems on that part. Um, there is also the uh, get help a uh, self-help tool online um, for people who are concerned about their online um, behavior, who are uh, involved in watching um, child sexual abuse material, um, who are or who are at risk um, of viewing um, child sexual exploitation material. Um, also, this was originally uh, developed by, of course, by Stop It Now UK, and then we applied it to our own legal system. Um, it was developed in association with Stop It Now uh, Netherlands, and then more recently we applied it to professionals as well, um, because of a lot of the tools and exercises which can be found on the match on the website are also applicable in therapy, uh, which Stop It Now cannot offer, but in, in in this way, we try to support the specialized treatment centers as well. And then next year, we will be launching um, a support group program, which will consist of live group sessions um, with family members or people who are concerned about someone in their environment. Um, these will take place, I believe, five or six times a year uh, and will kick off in 2023. Um, there will also be a forum and um, online support groups to assist and um, system. These are some Dutch, obviously, but examples of uh, flyers and folders that have been sent um, to the police in Flanders, um, to general practitioners and other intermediaries. Um, Stop It Now has also been involved in uh, more traditional social media campaigns uh, by contributing in radio interviews, um, writing in newspapers, by being involved in television programs. Um, and more also, we've been involved in more uh, targeted campaigns through social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, TikToks. Um, we've also been involved in um, porn sites. Um, there's been uh, a campaign which has published trigger warnings, uh, um, not trigger warnings, uh, but warning pages um, when people uh, were typing troublesome search queries. Um, oh yes, I forgot about this, but there are also plans to um, further implement this campaign uh, on Omegle and Grindr. Um, and other online fora, which are often used for used for grooming children. Uh, some challenges and suggestions we're facing in Stop It Now. Um, well, the growth of child sexual exploitation material has been, I think, the biggest challenge uh, since COVID. A lot of kids are still not safe, even in their own homes, and global crises such as COVID have definitely contributed to that. Um, so we need to work on further ways to further um, support and uh, assist these target groups in finding help in stopping um, the abuse from taking place. Um, 
the prof another challenge we're facing is professional secrecy and confidentiality um, because we are everyone who mans the helpline is bound by professional secrecy but sometimes we are under pressure from the government um, to report on cases where or when we've had um, contact with someone who has uh, been involved in sexual abuse with a minor when the authorities are unaware of the abuse, even when the abuse has taken place in the past, when there is no further risk of reoffending at present, or when there is not um, no imminent danger to a minder, in as far as we can assess that through the helpline, it's not easy to do. Um, but we, well, we we've had had instances where we've had to, to report, but oftentimes our professional secrecy prevents us from sharing information with the authorities. Um, this means that sometimes uh, I or someone else who mans the helpline becomes aware of um, sexual abuse, which is not known by the government. Um, and while from a criminal justice perspective, this can view as it can feel like impunity, um, it is really important to maintain our professional secrecy because we know that fear of legal con consequences is a large barrier to uh, engage in uh, professional help and seeking professional help um, and from a public health perspective it is really important to focus on um, well, uh, oof, sorry stress is getting to me um, from a public health perspective it is really important to focus on uh, preventing further abuse from taking place and in guiding um, anyone who takes contact with the helpline to further help um, we are still dependent on um, well funding of course but temporary funding uh, which makes it hard to maintain a stable staff and um, a stable team to mend the helpline um, it is important for us to engage in um, well the mm, Sorry, um, it's important for us to engage in political uh, discussion and in a public health view uh, to secure further funding. A few suggestions to overcome these challenges are first and foremost to social awareness regarding uh, the importance of perpetrator oriented preventive help um, by uh, Addressing the correct use of language, correct use of imagery uh, when talking about these teams. Um, in sharing research regarding um, what, what we can find in our own research programs, but also uh, in international findings, because we know it's really important to provide more than anecdotal research regarding the effectiveness of the help offered through Stop It Now. Um, and shared research can definitely contribute to that. Um, we need more evidence, always more evidence, um, and also uh, rely on partnerships with victim and situation oriented groups. Um, and then lastly, the uh, switch from public and political viewpoints regarding perpetrator oriented help uh, into improve the prevention of child sexual abuse. I'm sorry, I feel like I my head, my brain exploded from time to time. You did this really is well, not Charles. my normal habitat, and, uh, but thank you for hanging on uh, and allowing uh, me to be here today. Charlotte, it's our pleasure and um, thank you so much for coming and you don't need to apologise, you did a sterling job. Um, what I found particularly interesting is some of the some of the points you made there just at, well, it was weaved throughout, but society views, social awareness, the public health approach to prevention and making it OK to work in perpetrator prevention. And I think that is a key challenge for all of us to continue to drive forward um, change in that space that makes it OK for people to reach out and get help. And then people know it's OK to reach out and get help and they're allowed to reach out and get help and say, I'm not OK. So all of those sort of social awareness, society views, public health approach to prevention, collectively, I think we just need to continue um, on that on that journey to make that make that more acceptable um, in our different nations. So thank you, Charlotte, for that. Um, and next up, Georgia from Australia, which is one of our newest uh, Stop It Now family members. Um, Georgia, I can't see you, so I'm going to assume that you are there and will join us imminently. 
Yes, I'm here. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's great to join the conversation regarding Stop It Now. And for those of you who don't know, I used to work in the Stop It Now UK and Ireland team. So it's uh, great to see some familiar faces and voices. Can I check that you can see my slides okay? Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. So I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm dialing in from. That's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, as said earlier, I want to acknowledge that this always has and will always be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. I will pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So we've heard from a lot of the other Stop It Now team, and I acknowledge that I'm later down, so I don't need to repeat what Stop It Now is. I think we, we, we get the concept of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit around the Australian context in particular. Um, I'm going to start by taking kind of a snapshot about where we got to today before our launch, which was only a few months ago. So in 2017, the Royal Commission into the Institutional Response to Child Sexual Abuse was conducted and acknowledged among many other areas that there was a gap in secondary prevention and in particular um, focusing on that perpetrator prevention service. So working with those concerned about their own thoughts or behaviors. From that in 2021, the national strategy to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse um, was released. And within this, there was a commitment to a service for people concerned about their own sexual thoughts or behaviours towards children and acknowledge that this would be informed by the Stop It Now model in the UK and Ireland in particular. But obviously, as we've learned from today, there's lots of learning from all the, the Stop It Now family. Um, Stop It Now actually did previously run here in Australia for around 10 years from a, a small little rural town called Bumbuck. Um, maybe small is an incorrect assumption, but yeah, it did run for a while and Unfortunately, for funding reasons and a variety of other reasons, it's no longer around. So who are we? We're Jesuit Social Services and um, we have been working with boys and men for around 45 years now. So we also had a birthday this year, separate to the Stop It Now anniversaries. Um, and in around 2017 is when we began the discussion of talking about Stop It Now, acknowledging that we're working with boys and men often after uh, the harm has been caused and the importance of, of trying to work more upstream and prevent the harm from occurring in the first place. In 2019, in collaboration with the University of Melbourne, we completed a scoping study um, on what Stop It Now would look like in an Australian context. And this is available online for anyone that wants to have a read. Um, and then in 2020, we received philanthropic funding and now this is for a three year pilot. Um, and as you can tell, we're two years into that and acknowledging the importance of building relationships, both nationally and internationally. Um, a lot of work was put into the preparation for the launch of the service. So Stop It Now is very similar to all our other sister organizations in terms of who we target. We are at a much smaller scale, acknowledging that we literally launched three months ago and we are philanthropically funded. So we're particularly focused on adults concerned about their own thoughts or behaviours, non-offending family members and professionals. Just during that pilot period, uh, acknowledging that we want to expand to actively target parents concerned about um, children's sexualised behaviour or children's own signs of abuse as well. We are an anonymous and free helpline service. At the moment, we're running a telephone and live chat function but email has been on our plan from the very beginning and so we're continuing to explore that. We actually call ourselves an anonymous service and we acknowledge something that's quite unique about Australia compared to some of the sister organisations is the mandatory reporting obligations which is actually the opposite of what we just heard um, from Stop It Now Flanders. We are obligated to report any child sexual abuse offences that occur um, and so although anonymous, it's not necessarily confidential in nature. We are support and action based service. We offer individuals a safe space to talk through their concerns, understand the impact of child sexual abuse and provide psychoeducation and advice to assist callers to make those positive behavioural changes 
to protect children from child sexual abuse. Alongside the helpline, we have our online content, um, which we have developed with great support from the Stop It Now UK and Ireland team. We don't currently have our own self-help modules, and so at the moment we're pointing people towards the Stop It Now UK and Ireland team. There is work being done in Australia to adapt those resources to an Australian context, and I actually think I saw Belinda on the invite list today, so um, great to have her join in, and hopefully that's something that will occur in the future. Like all the other Stop It Now services, we exist as one piece of the puzzle. And so a lot of the services built around effective referrals in, but also effective referrals out of the service for those that require more ongoing and in-depth psychological support. As we talk about these being one piece of the puzzle, the puzzle is important to acknowledge the breadth of collaboration, um, both nationally and internationally. And I went for a, a national slide because I thought if I'm going to go through all the international relationships I've connected with, I'll just mention a lot of people that are here today. Um, so this isn't to take away from the amazing international relationships that we've developed and continue to develop. Um, but I wanted to point towards some Australian services that we've connected with, some of which sit on our national advisory group, some of which play a key um, role in referrals into the service. Um, which would be Google, Apple and Pornhub in, in particular, MindGeek services in general, but Pornhub is a, a well-known visual. Um, and then the, the referrals out of the service, um, many of which are on the screen, but also that collaboration, that, that ongoing learning that we have from these, these different organisations. One that I wanted to point out in particular, because I wish I could talk to all of these uh, in more detail, but is is Brave Hearts, who are a victim survivor organisation that we've worked very closely with from the beginning and have helped facilitate some research um, with us regarding victim survivor perspectives of Stop It Now. Um, it's really important that we have that victim survivor voice at the centre of the work that we do. Uh, and we go back to our roots and with Fran Henry, um, bring that victim survivor, survivor voice from the very beginning. So as I said, we're very new. We launched uh, three months ago. And so I just thought, as everyone loves some numbers, that I would share some details around where we're up to today. Um, we are only open for 14 hours a week. That's one form, um, acknowledging the limited funding uh, that we have today. Um, and so today we've had 47 calls and chats from 24 individuals. Very similar stats to our other Stop It Now uh, colleagues. 50% are concerned about themselves, 21% concerned about someone else, 12% are professionals, and we have a, a other area acknowledging the high quantity of silent slash hang up calls that we get at the beginning as people build trust in the service. Alongside that, we've had a lot of activity on our website and um, my colleagues always talk about the fact that we could have really sat here for three months waiting for a call. Uh, and so we've been lucky enough to receive any calls. And so I'm always surprised by the activity that we've had, especially on our website. So we've had two, nearly 2,200 people access the website. And what's particularly interesting is our biggest referral pathway is direct URL entries or no identified referral pathway. Um, but our next one is the pornography warning pages that we've um, got up, very similar to the images that were just shared, but on Pornhub and other, other services, acknowledging that individuals who are trying to access illegal content on pornography websites are getting that warning page. And for some, that click through and that warning page would be enough. Accessing the content on the website would be enough um, to prevent the escalation or continuation of the child sexual abuse behaviour. Um, and so I think it's just really important to point out how much activity that's bringing to the website uh, and how we're motivated to continue to explore those online referral pathways as well as uh, grassroots pathways. Um, this is just the one graph I couldn't help myself of putting a pretty graph, um, and I found this one the most interesting to point out, knowing what I know about the other Stop It Now services and, and where we may be slightly different so far. Um, to date, the calls that we've had coming in, 40% of them relate to the individuals who've committed an offence and are known to the police. 
35%, which I think is a staggering number, relate to individuals who have committed uh, harmful behaviour or illegal behaviour and an unknown to the police. 20%, again, I think is a particularly high number, are those who have sexual thoughts about children who have not committed any offending behaviour to date. And so what this is showing is 55% of the calls um, and 5% are related to harmful sexual behaviour of young people. This means that 55% of the, our callers that are coming in are those who pose a risk to children or have engaged in illegal behaviour and may not be able to access support from any other pathway or are not currently accessing support because of that, that uh, illegal element. And so really demonstrate the importance of a gap that Stop It Now can, can fill. Um, I'm probably running out of time. I did work with Donald for a while, so I've stolen a lot of his traits. Um, and so I'm going to try and run through this bit really quickly. But our, our next steps are you know, most of our journey. Three months is very different to 30 years, 20 years, 10 years and five years. So we've got a lot to do. Um, our philanthropic funding runs till October 2023. There is national funding, as I highlighted from national strategy, which is likely to come out next year, although we don't know the specific timeline of that. It will go to tender. And so we will be applying for that. And, hoping to be successful but if not there is an offender prevention service that will be launching in Australia that is nationally funded and um, we're going to continue to work with the University of Melbourne regarding the action research evaluation so as everyone said we need to build uh, evidence and so the University of Melbourne are leading their work with that um, we're going to continue to build our national and international collaborative relationships with service providers law enforcement child protection tech companies and many many more we want to assist with the research knowledge that exists and so in collaboration with academics such as Michael Salter and many others, um, we're hoping to continue the conversation regarding what this population looks like, how we can prevent this behaviour from happening. Um, Donald said it really well, pathways into offending are really powerful, but also what are pathways out of offending and how can we build that knowledge? As I said, international collaboration and deterrence work is central and we're also doing some work alongside Stop It Now for young people concerned about their sexual thoughts or behaviours which is our Worried About Sex and Pornography project and um, we're going to continue working on that acknowledging the overrepresentation of young people who are engaging in, in harmful sexual behaviour and that is my time definitely up. Thank you, Thank you Georgia. Bob. Thanks, Georgia. It's Thanks, a Georgia. pleasure to see you um, and actually really just interesting to hear about how things are going with a project, as you say, early doors, three months in, um, not the 20 years, 30 years, five years or 10 years that, that others are celebrating, but how that's going and how people are finding you and how you're going about building that profile and bringing people to the service. So that was really, really interesting. Um, I will just take this opportunity to remind people to take a break. So at some point, do switch camera off, get a coffee, do whatever you need to, because um, it's been quite busy so far and we're not about to slow down. Um, so do take a break as, as and when uh, that works for you. Um, so we've got two more uh, presentations about our Stop It Now family. And next up is Lola from Brussels. Again, I can't see you, so hopefully uh, you're here with us and I will pass over now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There you are. Marvelous. Yeah, hi, Hello. Everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you to be. Thank you for including us in this uh, very well done symposium. We are so happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to share, try to share my screen really quickly. Um, can you tell me if you see that? On yes. The yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm gonna. Oh, sorry. No, I have to. Okay. Um, okay. So my presentation will details the launch of the uh, Stop It Now Brussels. Uh, which is a free and uh, confidential help helpline that aims to prevent sexual 
abuse against minors by providing a safe space for adults with sexual fantasies about children and adolescents to be heard. Firstly, I, I'm sorry if this is repetitive for some of you, but in order to better understand the context in uh, which this service was implemented in Brussels, uh, I wanted to take the country's division into account. So, because Belgium is a monarchy and a federal state with uh, numerous provinces and um, communities and three main regions, which, which are the Flemish region, the Wallonia region and the region of Brussels capital. Uh, Flanders consists in mostly uh, Flemish-speaking communes in the northern part of the country. In this region, um, the forensic, the University of Forensic Centrum uh, coordinates missions to assist and treat uh, adult sexual offenders. Its primary mission uh, is to assess patients with deviant or tra transgressive sexual behaviors. And furthermore, it is a scientific research center that provides regular studies and literature from its own clinic, which also facilitates the formation of a professional specialized in or other interest in this specific matter. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause. The, um, in, um, in 2017, the UFC implemented Stop It Now Flanders for the Flemish region of Belgium. Um, recently, the airplane, like uh, as Charlotte said earlier, uh, the airplane proudly celebrated its fifth year anniversary with a symposium conducted in uh, Antwerp. This ongoing project enables prevention, uh, therapeutic orientation, and assistance to adults who present sexual behavior and pose the risk of sexual behaviors towards children. As for the region of Wallonia, um, which consists is of mostly French-speaking uh, communes in the southern part of the country, there is a center called Le Centre Unité de Psychopathologie Légale, um, who has, uh, which has enacted a specialized service called CEOS, uh, in order to receive calls that range from uh, the admission of deviant fantasy or sexual uh, behaviors to question um, uh, more broad uh, regarding, for example, the notion of consent. And addition, additionally, in some cases, there are calls concerning the topic of uh, possible inappropriate conduct in relation to the to the state law. The um, Belgium recently um, uh, entered a new code of uh, sexual uh, law, so people are quite interesting about knowing the differences. As for the region of Brussels capital, there is uh, the center uh, where I work. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm sorry, there was a bit of a mix up. I'm gonna share my screen again. But the center where I work is um, Okay, we'll do like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the center which, um, the center where I work, sorry, uh, so the Centre d'Appui Bruxellois, uh, which was founded according to the law of, uh, of the 12th March 2000, uh, sealed the, the accord between the federal state and the regional Ministry of Health. Uh, so the Centre d'Appui Bruxellois shares similar commune uh, missions with the UFC uh, regarding the formation of professionals, for example, and uh, research endeavors. Moreover, it has specific missions related to the psychological evaluation and the therapeutic orientation of, um, for, convicting, for convicted sex offenders. And uh, early on in 2010, the Centre uh, the Centre d'Appui Bruxellois took an interest uh, in, um, in the Stop It Now project and uh, similar airplane services in Europe. The interest led to the discussion about the creation and, um, and the implementation of such uh, a service uh, in its own mission. As such, this topic uh, was featured in every conference, political interaction that we could, uh, also public intervention in which the center participated. However, until 2021, so last year, 
uh, the Centre d'Appui Bruxellois had difficulty in finding a substantial financial subvention that could allow such a project to be put into action. So finally, after responding to uh, a project offer in um, in um, uh, offer presented by uh, Brussels Prevention and Security, the organization in charge of uh, services and resources dedicated. So it's very broad, but it, it fits into this kind of a uh, uh, project uh, offer um, dedicated to human protection in the region of uh, Brussels capital. So our center in Brussels was finally granted the funding to establish his helpline. Um, and nearly after a year of um, reflection, research and uh, preparation, Stop It Now, Brussels finally opened its, its helpline uh, with the launch of a website. Uh, which offer all the information uh, necessary to access uh, all communication platforms, uh, including our phone number, our email address, and a, a chat box. The service has been publicly available since uh, the 30th of, se of uh, September two, 2022, so of this year, so it's quite recent. And um, Stop It Now Brussels is uh, comprised of a very humble and small uh, group of dedicated professionals. Uh, we are currently three professionals uh, taking calls plus uh, our coordinator. So we hope we can soon um, uh, know a similar growth uh, as uh, Stop It Now Netherlands and uh, hopefully reach the, the a 10 people team. Uh, Stop It Now uh, Brussels is comprised um, Sorry, I, I just said that. Um, so my colleague uh, Michel Jensen, is the, who is a psychologist and a sexologist, is the coordinator of the project. Uh, the team is exclusively um, composed of cl psychological clinicians who are responsible for responding to the individual who reach out using one of the various platforms. Since the end, the end of uh, September, we have already had a few interactions which enabled uh, the professional to experiment and communicate uh, using all the three medium, telephone, uh, email and chat box. Our service is open um, through phone and chat every Monday uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. The phone is also available uh, on the same um, Oh, no, sorry. And the phone is also available every Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. and Fridays from um, 10 to 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, as we only have a, a few uh, opening hours during the day, we wanted to ensure that every time slot was more or less represented. And over the course, uh, over the course of the... Um, of uh, October, sorry, the Stop It Now uh, Brussels site had over uh, 1,200 visitors and over uh, 1,400 visitors for the month of November, uh, which we are very pleased about. And uh, the individuals who use the service consist of main target population, meaning that they are potentially attracted to minors or fear that they and fear that they might act on it. In response, our, our clinicians already have uh, made several referrals to the various professional in our network in Brussels. At the moment, the very main goal of Stop It Now Brussels is to expand its visibility and accessibility by developing a broad communication campaign. Uh, we are currently working on um, a publicity campaign that we hope to release in the beginning of uh, 2023. We believe that this measure will allow us to expand our exposure for sure. With this campaign, we also aspire to not only reach our target audience, but also other individuals who might uh, have questions on the matter and who may simply possess the desire to join in the effort uh, to end sexual abuse toward children and adolescents. So uh, I cannot show it to you yet, uh, um, sadly, but uh, posters and brochures and, um, and flyers are on their way. And uh, our campaigns, as I say, uh, aims to be targeted and, um, and uh, also uh, spread to a wider population to raise 
awareness among other publics like close member of family and friends, also professional and even potential victim who we from from whom we already receive calls. And um, so at present, Stapitna Brussels is a is a very humble service as I said, due to the limited uh, hours each professional can dedicate to the project, but we remain very passionate about expanding the endeavors and aiming for wider exposure in the long run. That was my presentation. Thank you all so much for your attention. Ola, thank you so much. Um, and I, for one, really look forward to your future growth and development yeah. and expansion from the three people that you are at the moment and hopefully a lot of the work that you've described sort of around the publicity campaign that you're going to be launching in the new year will really help support that in terms of the demand and then evidencing the need for yeah. expansion we and growth. So. We hope so, thank you so much. So we look forward to watching and working with you on that journey. Uh, thank you. So the final presentation from our Stop It Now projects comes from the UK uh, and Vicky and Sarah are going to present this one for us. Thank you, I'll share my screen. Can you see that okay? I can Sarah, lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's great to be part of this conference today. I'm Sarah Vipers, Practitioner Researcher with the Lucy Faithful Foundation and together with Wiki, Vicky, our Senior Helpline um, Manager, we will present on the 20 years of Stop It Now UK and Ireland, um, the pillars of our work and an outlook into the future. Just to give you a bit of um, uh, background on the context that we work in here in the UK and Ireland, um, the UK has a population of 67 million and there are 5 million in Ireland. The UK's National Crime Agency estimates that currently approximately 550,000, so 850,000 people are posing a sexual risk to children in the UK. I'm not aware of a similar estimate for Ireland at the moment. Our target group are people with concerns about child sexual abuse. That includes people who are concerned about their own thoughts and behaviors towards children, both online and offline. People concerned about the behavior of another adult, adults concerned about a child who may have been abused, professionals calling for case advice and survivors of child sexual abuse. The Lucy Faithful Foundation operates from four offices across the UK, um, but our helpline is run by advisors, mostly working from home all over the UK. Some of our key partners include law enforcement, like the National Crime Agency, the Internet Watch Foundation, National Health Service and Google, and our helpline is funded by UK government, EVAC and other charitable donations. Um, I will start with a timeline of our helpline. So in 1992, our charity, the Lucy Faithful Foundation was established, um, who then 10 years later launched the confidential Stop It Now UK and Ireland helpline. In 2008 and 2009, our Stop It Now Scotland and Wales projects were launched um, with the help of some funding from their local governments and they run their own campaigns and projects. In 2010, we launched our anonymous email service, which allows people to send us anonymous emails. Um, we use a system that creates a, a code um, so that we can't see people's email addresses. In 2014, our helpline, as well as the Dutch helpline, were independently evaluated by Natsen, which showed the positive impact the helpline has on our callers. Um, and a year later, we launched our online self-help for people who are concerned about their thoughts or behaviour. We now have two separate self-help projects, so to say, um, get support for people who are concerned about their sexual thoughts or offline behaviour towards children and get help for people who are concerned about their online behaviour. In the same year, we launched um, our online offending deterrence campaign, which has run since then um, for every year. And this is something that Vicky will um, talk to you more about later. In 2018, we launched an online peer support forum for the family and friends of those who view indecent images of children. And in the same year, the helpline was expanded due to some increased funding. 
In 2020, partly as a response to the global pandemic, we launched our confidential live chat service, um, which allows people to speak to us, uh, to our advisors in real time uh, using the uh, messaging service. Over the last couple of years, um, we aim to increase the accessibility of the helpline. We now have a Welsh speaking advisor who takes calls in English and Welsh. And we launched the use of language line, which allows us to um, include an interpreter um, via conference call when someone calls the helpline um, who prefers to speak um, with our advisors in a different language. Um, we also launched a deterrence campaign in collaboration with MindGeek, who run various adult content websites, including Pornhub. Now, if um, a user of these websites searches for various search terms, they will see a warning message or a chat bot um, will pop up and they um, educate the user about the um, illegality of indecent images of children and encourage them to get in touch with Stop It Now. Um, so who are our advisors? Um, we currently have 31 um, phone line and chat advisors um, who work part time, as well as other um, Lucy Faithful Foundation staff who work on the helpline. Our advisors come from a wide variety of backgrounds with lots of experience and expertise. This is an overview of um, the amount of people who've got in touch with our helpline over the last 20 years. In total, we have helped 63,790 individual people who have made 123,380 calls, emails or chats to the helpline. We do encourage people to get in touch with us repeatedly for ongoing support, so that's why we make the distinction between callers and calls. As you saw in the previous slide, um, the last financial year has been the busiest so far. And here you can see some highlights from the last year. Um, we've received over 15,000 contacts by over 7,600 individuals. The majority of contacts were made through the phone line, followed by email and then the live chat. So who contacts our helpline? Um, as has already been pointed out, that's quite a similar proportion to um, what Kelly and Georgia reported for the Netherlands and Australia. Um, the largest group of people who contact our helpline are adults who are concerned about their own behaviour with 43%. So these are people who report they have sexual thoughts towards children um, or who have engaged in illegal online behaviour or um, harmful sexual behaviour offline. The second largest group are adults concerned about another adult's behaviour with 27%. Um, so these could be adults who have noticed um, concerning behaviour in someone else or um, they might be partners or family members of people who have recently been arrested. We do see some trends um, and changes over um, the groups who've got in touch um, with, with the helpline over the years. Um, over the last years, we've had an increase in people who are concerned about themselves contacting the helpline. And um, we've noticed a particular um, big increase in young people under the age of 18 contacting us with concerns about their own thoughts or behaviour. And related to that, also an increase in parents and carers who are concerned about a child's behaviour. Our helpline is not simply a listening service. We do encourage callers, emailers and chatters to take active steps towards child protection. In the last financial year, 98% of callers agreed to take at least one action to protect a child. And of those who got back in touch with us and um, were in touch with us repeatedly, 93% said that they had taken actions that were agreed in previous contacts. Then another spotlight on our quite new chat service. It was launched in September 2020. And currently, approximately 5% of our um, service users are using the live chat. We don't really see a difference in the type of concerns between chatters and callers, um, but we've noticed some differences in the characteristics between chatters and callers. So chatters seem to be younger, 16% are under the age of 21 compared to 6% of helpline callers. 
and um, related to the people who are concerned about their own thoughts or behavior, more chatters are not known to the authorities compared to helpline callers, which might be um, because they perceive the live chat as more anonymous, um, not having to speak to someone over the phone, not being able to hear someone's voice, and that's why they might be um, choosing to use the live chat instead. Okay, that's all from me, and now we'll hand over to Vicky now. Thank you. As Sarah said, I'm the senior helpline manager for the helpline. Um, as part of the Lucy Faithful Foundation, um, I thought it might be helpful to look at the three strategic pillars which the foundation use to guide their work. So reach, research and advocacy. And I'm going to go through those um, with you now. Thinking about our growth, and I think this applies to, to all of the organisations that are here today, we talked about how many people have contacted the helpline, but that doesn't really show how many people we have helped because each of those people have a family member who um, you know, will have been affected by their behaviour. There are children connected to those individuals. There are potential victims that have been stopped because of the work that we do. So when we look at our reach, it is much wider than the numbers would necessarily kind of first indicate. Thinking about the Stop It Now reputation, and um, we see this globally as well, that actually the feedback we get is phenomenal. We have some really positive responses from the people that contact us. Absolutely brilliant, a godsend at a time of huge trauma for the whole family. Professional, reliable, honest and encouraging. Thanks to your amazing team, I'm so grateful for the help I received to date. The more I can become educated, the better version of myself I can become. Your time, information and resources are priceless. Hearing that kind of feedback is what motivates our staff to keep going. But it is also about the reputation that we have with other professionals, with other organisations and with governments. And here are just a couple of quotes that um, have come in from, from professionals that have worked with us. You can see more in the uh, 20 year report that Sarah has been diligently working on this year. Um, they feel a crucial but often neglected niche in the public health response to child sexual abuse with their focus on primary and secondary interventions aimed at stopping abuse before it happens. The helpline is the key prevention service in the UK in relation to sexually abusive behaviour and has proven to be a lifeline for so many. It is fantastic hearing those kind of responses and to know that that helps with our reach, both with the individuals that we help, but also in the wider um, government sphere and hopefully in, in the international sphere as well. What have we lost here or is it not? Just waiting for the next <laughs> slide. Can you see Thank the you. research one? Yes, can now. Thank you. So yeah, talking about research, uh, Sarah mentioned the biggest evaluation that we've had of the helpline, which was um, Stop It Now UK and Ireland and also Stop It Now Netherlands, which um, was an evaluation looking at the impact that the helpline had on people concerned about their own thoughts and behaviour. So it helped them understand that behaviour can be changed, helped them recognise their protective factors, helped them to implement techniques and change behaviour, and also recognising the behaviour as risky. As other research has been done since then, slightly smaller scale things, those similar findings come out and so does the similar finding that actually one of the big concerns for people is about confidentiality and not believing that really it is anonymous and it is confidential. And that is a hurdle that I think probably we're all very familiar with trying to overcome and it is one that we are constantly working on. I'm really pleased how many people have talked about research today. Um, we are looking at future research and part of the reason that we've got Sarah in her role as a researcher within the team is to try and increase our capacity to do research. Um, there, we're about to start an evaluation of the online self-help material that um, we call Get Help. So that is going to be starting imminently to see if we can make some improvements to that. 
we've been collaborating with Cardiff University and they have already done um, a project looking at our chat service. We're now looking um, to collaborate with them further. So they're going to be looking at some of the seasonal changes that we notice with people contacting the helpline. We want to focus on chatters that are contacting us with autistic spectrum disorders to see if there's something we can do there to help make it more accessible. Um, and we also are very keen to understand a bit more about partners who have discovered um, offending and they contact us and then maybe go on to report their partners offending to see if there's something we can learn from that. We are really keen to collaborate as much as possible and a, a theme coming out of today is the need for international research and we are very much involved in, in that and we would love to be part of that in the future. Thinking about our advocacy, um, we've already touched upon some of our, our partners. We've got good relationships with law enforcement. Obviously, we are funded by the government in the Home Office and Ministry of Justice. We try to work collaboratively with other charities, NSPCC, um, Internet Watch Foundation. We, we want to collaborate, but also we want to collaborate internationally. So our Stop It Now family are very important and it's great to be a part of um, the ongoing work with that, but also why we wanted it not just just to be about Stop It Now today, about those other related prevention services and how we can collaborate with them. We also are really keen to build on our um, online um, campaign and our online resources. So we've got the Stop It Now website with the self-help material get support and get help. We've got the family and friends forum, which hope, hopefully helps to offer some support for those people concerned about someone else who's, who might be offending. Um, we've also got information on there for parents and carers of young people who might have got into trouble online or they might be worried they're a victim of, of child sexual abuse. Later, um, well, early next year, hopefully, they'll be we'll be launching the SURE website, which is um, for under 18s, and that should also have a live chat service on there as well and then we've got our parents protect website which kind of does what it says really it's helping educate parents so that they can learn how to better protect their children to look out for grooming warning signs it's also got lots of resources on there a traffic light tool things like that to help educate parents around child sexual abuse um, one of the biggest campaigns that we've got is the deterrence campaign and other Stop It Now's have sort of spoken briefly about this, but ours started back in 2015, where we interviewed some of the people who'd been calling the helpline, who'd been arrested, and we wanted to know what might have stopped them before the police came to knock at the door. What sort of messages might have hit home to get them to change their behaviour? using those key messages about understanding that their behaviour was risky and recognising the consequences, recognising that there's real children being harmed. Some short films were developed. In that first camp campaign period, they were viewed two over 2.3 million times. There were 92 pieces of media um, involvement and we had 8,800 people who visited the website in the first six months and calls to the helpline increased by 25 percent. We've been very fortunate to get funding to be able to repeat this campaign each year since then and we've been able to develop it and extend it to also include online chatters as well. And this is just a little snapshot to this year's campaign. You'll see from this graph that before Outside of the campaign period, we get about 2,000 visits to the website on average per week. During the campaign period, that peaked at about 14,000. So it's incredible to see the impact that that had. We also had uh, 291 media articles related to it, and a, we saw a 38% increase in unarrested online offenders contacting us during the campaign period. So it is clearly working. We've also um, done some surveys both online and via the helpline and people have fed back that they've made at least one positive change in their attitudes or behaviour. They've increased their awareness of their personal and legal consequences. And interestingly, we saw that people who call the helpline reported completely looking at the indecent images of children, whereas people that only use the online resources commented that they reduced their use of indecent images of children. So again, noticing that difference between those that are using only online, but also those engaging with the helpline. 
And we've spoken about wanting to have our say and influence policy and we do get involved in many different boards um, with the NCA in indirect victims group, the We Protect Go Global Alliance Civic Society group, roundtable events, as many things as we can to get our message out there. And we've been lucky to be recognised in the government's Home Office tackling child sexual abuse strategy where they committed to in continuing the investment that they make in the helpline. The We Protect Go Global Alliance um, threat assessment recognised the collaboration with MindGeek for the deterrence messaging and recognised the um, Rethink Chat partnership with the Internet Watch Foundation and MindGeek. And the Police's Foundation report have encouraged the government to invest more in offender treatment services and recognise the important work that LFF do. Um, Sarah mentioned I was going to talk about the future and I wanted to talk about kind of what excites us for the future and there is a lot. We're in the very fortunate position um, where we have seen some growth as well this year um, and it was really nice to see that um, the Netherlands sort of talking about their rapid growth. We've recently taken on nine new uh, phone advisors and four new chat advisors. So um, the phone advisors are trained and taking calls themselves now. The chat advisors are just starting their training. But that excitement of the development and now the bigger reach that we can have through that. Research, I've already spoken about the research, but we're really, really keen to get more involved in research and particularly international research. And, you know, Nadine's highlighted the benefit of that international research. So we're really hoping that today can be a springboard for getting some other excitement and some starting of that journey. We want to amplify our advocacy work. We want to keep reaching out and having a say and being heard and changing the way that people tackle child sexual abuse as I think is being recognised now. We do believe it is preventable. Hopefully today is the start of some real external momentum. We can see that there is the appetite for it just by the response that we had from this conference. When John um, Donald mentioned setting up a conference a few months ago, we weren't sure how much interest we would get. The number of people that have turned up today and wanted to speak shows that that passion is there. So we're really hoping to see that move forward. And there are going to be opportunities that we can't quite see yet. Our live chat service and our advisors working from home were a result of the pandemic. You know, if someone asked me a few years ago if that would happen for us, I would have probably said no, particularly advisors working from their own homes. But actually the opportunity came up and we took it and we are really keen to take any further opportunities as they come up. Um, and really part of the presentation from us was just to remind people and share that the Stop It Now campaign, it's more than a helpline, it is a campaign to stop child sexual abuse and we have such a big reach and that goes for all of, all of the family and it is really exciting to see how all of the Stop It Nows have developed and are continuing to do so. Now I believe I have the, the privilege to um, start the call for action which is to introduce the breakout rooms so we have we're going to ask you to um, think about some of the issues that Nadine and Sue raised earlier which is about the challenges for the Stop It Now family challenges around sharing resources protecting the brand and extending our reach now I noticed that Charlotte actually um, started answering some of these with some of the suggestions that she made in her presentation earlier so you might want to use that as a starting point but as um, Deborah mentioned if we could have someone from each group just making a few notes and then feeding that back in the chat we're going to collate that afterwards and then we can respond on it and share those so um i'll let um what one one moment vicky i'm going to jump in yeah. just to say unsurprisingly we're running slightly over time nobody saw that coming did they <laughs> um so i am going to reduce the breakout room down to 15 minutes and we're going to um we have been uh, asked if we can facilitate a slight change in order but i want to check this with the other presenters who are coming up later so when we come back we will go ahead with charity and isabel and then we will go ahead with ainsley who i think has been up since 4 a.m waiting for her slot so um she's probably had that up to isabel from charité in germany first so isabel you're very um 
you're very welcome. And this is this is to look at colleagues, perpetrators, prevention work around the world outside of the Stop It Now family. So we're gonna we're gonna spread outside of Stop It Now. So Isabel, Isabel welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to bet on myself and trust that you can see my slides. And if you can't, shout out. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I am representing the Institute of Sexology and Sexual Medicine, which is a research institute within the Charité. And the Charité is one of the, if not the largest uh, hospital in the EU, now that we don't have England <laughs> to compete with in the European Union. Um, and we're a relatively small institute of about 20 to 25 clinicians and a small support team that works on public health communications and in my case, project management and international cooperation. So for the sake of this, um, uh, this presentation, I just want to focus, I guess, on some of the differences in the um, model that is present in the Kainteta Verden network, which was originally known as Prevention Project Dunkelfeld, compared to the Stop It Now model, just to keep it super relevant for this presentation. Is it I can't the moment, see I don't you. have your slides. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, let's try again. Happy to share them for you if you'd like. Um, I mean, it's just a PDF, so it shouldn't be so complicated. Have we got Prevention Project Dunkelfeld, PPD? Nothing. No. Nothing at all? No. No, nothing. Okay, maybe I will need someone to share them for me because there's Thanks, clearly Anne. some kind of technical glitch, but in any case, I can continue without slides if you're happy to see my face. <laughs> Yay. Um, perfect. Thanks, Sam. If you could just jump to the next one, that would be great. Wonderful. So Kainteta Verden is um, a network of treatment sites across Germany that offers free and confidential um, treatment to individuals with a sexual attraction to children, specifically those that have that fit the criteria of pedophilic disorder. And that's quite a different target group to the Stop It Now uh, the Stop It Now model in that it's a smaller group. Um, based on previous research and forensic samples, it's estimated that around 30 to 50 percent of known sex offenders, child sex offenders, would fit the criteria for pedophilic disorder. So it's smaller, but it's also a very high risk group and, an, and a group that has a higher likelihood of uh, recidivism. So that is part of the reason why it's a um, focus for our, our program. Um, originally, this was funded, uh, well, launched in 2005 and then funded by a foundation, um, the Volkswagen Foundation. But one major milestone for us was that in 2016, it was integrated into the legislation that meant that it had to be taken care of by our health insurance system. And that was for a period of five years, starting in 2018. And that really triggered the growth of from Prevention Project Dunkelfeld to the Kainteta Verden network. Kainteta Verden means don't become an offender. So there's now 14 treatment sites across Germany. Um, the, in 2018, there was another relevant milestone that was the lifting of the ban of remote treatment in Germany. And that meant we were then able to provide uh, our services in an online setting, which was very helpful, obviously, in the context of the pandemic. But it also meant that we could run a, a start a pilot specifically for a state in Germany that doesn't have a clinic um, and that was funded by the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. So that's something that's happening at the moment. Um, the, the integration into the public health system, as I mentioned, it was set for five years. So 2018 to the end of 2020, which means it's come theoretically come to an end. However, the external evaluation that was happening alongside that is still in progress. So the program has been extended while that finishes, and we expect the first publications to come from that in the middle of next year, being led by a separate external university, the University of Chemnitz. And that is looking at data from across all of the treatment sites, not just Berlin. One of the challenges in the past has been a smaller sample size limited to only Berlin and therefore lacking statistical significance to demonstrate, you know, um, confirmed evidence of effectiveness. So this will hopefully provide some really promising learnings, uh, whether they're positive or not, we'll find out something. Um, if you could just jump down to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Um, so as I said, 14 sites in Germany, as well as uh, sister projects in Switzerland, Switzerland and India. 
Something that might be relevant for this audience is that the treatment manual has been published in English in 2021, and that ma uh, manual includes all of the treatment modules that are part of the group therapy and as well as the worksheets. And individuals go, th um, go through a therapeutic uh, structure that lasts around 12 months, includes several modules that are tackled in group therapy as well as supplementary individual therapy. And they also have the option to bring in um, their important people in their lives that might help with their, um, their journey, uh, such as a partner or a family member. And finally, in some cases, their treatment is uh, complemented with pharmaceutical intervention, which is something that Christopher Rahm touched on earlier. So that's also something that's available in Germany. Um, I guess one of the huge differences that we have here is our high level of confidentiality. It's a criminal offence for a therapist to disclose information about somebody's history unless they believe that there is imminent harm to a child. Instead, they must take all the possible steps to reduce that likelihood of harm, and that results in quite a different um, structure when it comes to, or quite a different uh, tr level of trust from the patients. Uh, and also, um, so it's completely anonymous and confidential. And that also goes so far as their, um, in, their involvement in the program is never recorded on their health care record, even though the, it is funded by the healthcare system. So that's anonymous even to that extent. There's so much more I could talk about in terms of pro, um, communication, uh, marketing, partnerships. I think that if anyone's interested, they should jump onto the Kainteta Verden website. It is in German, but with the beauty of Google Translate, we can quickly view it in English. And it has everything from you, links to YouTube videos, podcast interviews, articles, you know, our advertisements that are in bus stops and on on um, uh, on everything. Uh, so it's all accessible there for anyone that's interested. Something just on the next slide, I'd like to point very quickly to Troubled Desire, which is a self-help platform based on the same modules and therefore based uh, targeted at the same group. So individuals with a pedophilic sexual attraction. So if anybody uh, has would like to be able to direct people to a very um, specialised resource, it's available in um, 11 languages <clears throat> with 11 more to come. Um, and just on the very last slide, if Sam wants to kindly slide down, thank you. I'm trying to keep to our, our short time. The next one, thanks. Yeah, so this is just a point to the future. Something that um, has come up already a lot today is evaluation, scalability, and cooperation. And this slide really reflects that. So we have several projects, some funded by the EU, some funded by other sources coming up or ongoing, which relate to providing anonymity for patients, providing scalable technologies online through chat or through online um, self-help, as well as collaboration through training. We offer an international training for dissexuality therapy. Um, as well as further collaborations with tech and so on and so forth. So we have a lot coming up. Um, I'm very excited about it. I would love to hear from anyone uh, in this conference who is interested in further collaborate, collaboration. I wish I had time to explain every single one of these projects, but I don't. But if you just jump to the next slide, you'll see my email address. And so anything to do with um, future projects, anything to do with international collaboration, um, that's the the contact address and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Isabel. Um, a whistle stop tour of all the fantastic work you do um, over there. But I did wonder, the projects you had at the end on that final slide, I found really interesting and I'm, I'm going to make a request. I hope you don't mind. For each, could you just do a quick summary, a write up of what they are? And then what we could do is circulate it to everyone who's been on the conference today, just so they can get a real snapshot summary of each of those that are coming up I think that might be really helpful because I feel a bit I feel a bit shortchanged that I didn't get the explanation of them all if I'm honest so of course if we if we do that happy. in writing after the event that would be Sounds really great really happy good. to pro provide the abstracts and I'm very excited that one of those projects in particular is with several of the Stop It Now partners so we're really excited to collaborate in this way it's not something we've done in the past so it's a huge step forward in terms of our international um, cooperation yeah brilliant thank you
Well, thank you, first of all, very much for the invitation, despite the very early start for me. I am uh, thrilled to be here and uh, have really appreciated, we're, we're just over a year old now in Canada, and I've really appreciated the support, particularly from Donald and Jenny, uh, the whole Stop It Now family, really, in their respective teams, in taking what you have learned over your 30 years and helping us to hopefully learn that pretty quickly. Uh, to be able to get where we are currently. So Talking for Change uh, is our perpetration prevention program. We are housed at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. CAMH is Canada's largest uh, mental health teaching hospital. And we're housed within a clinic called the Sexual Behaviors Clinic, which has existed for decades now. And the primary purpose of the Sexual Behaviors Clinic has been to offer assessment and treatment for individuals who have been convicted and are on probation or parole for a sexual offense. So we've done bits of this uh, true prevention work over the years, sort of off the side of, of the desk, if you will. Uh, so this has really formalized it in the past year. So our funding, uh, quite thankfully, and initially to start this program came from the federal government. Uh, and more of the justice and crime prevention arm of the federal government through Public Safety Canada. So that was a, a near million dollar grant, which ended in March of this year, had the good fortune of getting some additional funds from Google. Uh, and as I mentioned, we launched to the public uh, just over a year ago uh, and some exciting, uh, as yet not confirmed, but somewhat confirmed, um, pending funding of over $2 million from the federal government, still Public Safety Canada, for a longer duration this time, uh, for four years. So our staffing model, uh, I'll give you the grant period when we uh, actually had funding and, and then currently, which is uh, between funding. Uh, so we're still a, a pretty small team. Again, the Sexual Behaviors Clinic at large has many more uh, staff available, but this is specific for Talking for Change. Uh, Sky Stephen, Dean McPhail, and Corey Gerritsen and I were on the initial and are on the uh, renewed grant with Public Safety Canada. So uh, our helpline has been uh, managed really by myself as a psychologist and a psychotherapist with occasional support from a social worker uh, since we started. So we have two components to our program. One is national, all ages, and anonymous. Uh, we have a bilingual website in English and French uh, with some fairly, at this point, bare bones, online resources, information about confidentiality. But it serves as the hub for our helpline available six hours a day, Monday to Friday. Again, national and all ages, phone and live chat with DeepL translation. Uh, most of our uh, contacts come through chat at this point, and we've also partnered with Shkabe Makwa at CAMH to ensure that all of our services are safe and responsive for Indigenous individuals across the country. So this is not psychotherapy, this is not therapy, I think as other folks have talked about, even though it's me uh, as a psychologist on the helpline, we can't provide anonymous psychotherapy. A significant component for us, and I think as, as folks have been talking about today, is the evaluation. How do you evaluate the actual outcome that we want, which is uh, prevention of, of child sexual abuse or use of CSAM? So we've undertaken a pretty ambitious and interesting helpline evaluation, which I don't have time, of course, to talk about the results today. Uh, so as of this past weekend, roughly, we've had about 255 contacts to the helpline. Um, we certainly know there's a lot of room to grow, uh, and we've connected with an external marketing company to help us uh, with advertising and to help us grow that. But the helpline evaluation consists of two components. One is, um, I'll start with the post call, so demographic information that the helpline staff would enter at the end of the call about the nature of the call, the person reaching out, strategies offered uh, if we had to engage in a mandatory report because we are a mandatory reporting country, both for uh, disclosures of past abuse against a child and that person is still a child, or if uh, we have a reasonable suspicion that 
there is a child or group of children at risk of abuse. Uh, I have not made any mandatory reports out of the helpline as of yet, however. The ambitious piece is the in-call. So we ask participants uh, if it's uh, appropriate, if they're not overly distressed, if the, the clinician feels that it's appropriate, a set of questions at the front end and a set of questions at the back end of the call around distress, hopelessness, suicidality, and then at the end of the call to evaluate their perceived risk for engaging in CSEM use or um, contact offending. Uh, as compared to the start of the call. Uh, and there's some significant uh, results over that short and uh, brief anonymous uh, uh, helpline interaction. We have a non-anonymous component, which is your traditional psychotherapy. So this is by self-referral, which is rather unusual for a hospital environment to be able to access services via self-referral. Uh, offered in uh, a number of provinces throughout the country, either through CAMH or Dr. Sky Stevens in Atlantic Canada. And this at this point is merely a function of where we're uh, licensed to offer therapy. Uh, most of our services are virtual uh, with an in-person option. Uh, in Ontario if folks are interested. Start with a diagnostic sexological assessment with me and then can potentially move into treatment. A quick snapshot of our assessment referrals to date uh, from June. We started taking those referrals before we officially launched since we already had a referral pathway uh, until November. So this is specific for Ontario. We're working at branching out um, and building both in Atlantic Canada and other provinces. So you'll see most folks are self-referring to the program. Uh, we also have internal um, medical doctors who refer from other parts of the hospital. Again, the entire hospital uh, employs, I think, around 3,000 staff uh, and has significant inpatient and outpatient support for addiction and mental health. And then external MD referrals. Of course, there's um, a loss of individuals between referral and assessment. Some of these folks just frankly have yet to be contacted. That's why there's no assessment scheduled. Uh, others we determine are not appropriate for the program because they have pending legal charges uh, and can be diverted into community resources or to the SVC as a whole if they are on probation or parole. So 66 referrals for uh, assessment and again in a mandatory reporting context I, I still think this is pretty pretty good. Uh, this is a rather busy slide, but it shows you how the uh, referrals are managed by uh, Atlantic Canada or Ontario. Uh, we also have a detailed evaluation protocol for our therapy, uh, which starts with a, uh, as I said, a diagnostic assessment. And then if they go into therapy, we conduct the VRSSO and the SAPROF SO uh, pre-treatment and again at post-treatment to look at changes in risk and protective factors. They also do weekly self-report measures uh, and there's some clinician reporting measures. So there's a number of uh, data points to try and measure treatment change as well as a satisfaction interview at completion of treatment. A quick snapshot of our 16 week group psychotherapy program. Again, entirely virtual led by um, two clinicians. Uh, and roughly, you know, six to eight uh, individuals in the program. So we have a, a fair number of slides and data at this point about the results of our initial feasibility study. Uh, but I went with just this one, uh, where the therapy program has been access, access, acceptable to clients on a five point scale. Uh, so you'll see that most folks are quite um, happy and satisfied and, and felt welcome, uh, I think, as we're all talking about that safe and non-judgmental space, whether in traditional therapy or on a helpline is pretty essential. And I don't think I said at the front end, it seems like a pretty relevant point to highlight that our program is just for non-justice involved individuals, either who identify as having distress over their sexual interests or are concerned about their uh, risk to use CSEM or offend sexually. So it doesn't require a diagnosis of pedophilic disorder, although the vast majority of folks that go through the assessment process do have that diagnosis. Uh, our advertising to date, I think um, we're 
we're all or many of us are engaged with Pornhub and MindGeek in some capacity that has been uh, consistently a huge um, uh, factor in the uh, website visits and folks reaching out to us. Police have really been a significant support, particularly in the Toronto area. So now in all their media releases, when they make arrests for sexual offenses, they include not only information for survivors uh, of child sexual abuse who may want to access help uh, through the Canadian Center for Child Protection, but they also include information about Talking for Change now for individuals who might be concerned about their thoughts or behavior. And coordinates for our various social media uh, sites, our website, my email, and then the TFC email at large. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I'm I'm going to ask another request as well. I know you have the evaluation data that you may have liked to have shared more of. If if you choose, do send it across to us and we will also send that out because I think there's probably quite a bit of interest in that. Certainly, I was interested in seeing that. Um, also, just again, struck by the differences in the sort of health setting versus the sort of criminal justice setting and how interesting that is looking at these different pieces of work um, globally and internationally and I think that's something we we're certainly going to be talking more about off table um, as it just becomes more and more apparent to us. Um, thank you so much. And Ainsley, thank you for getting up at, I don't know, ridiculous time in the morning to come and join us. We're really grateful. So thank you. Um, in a change of billing now, tell me if I've got this right. I think, Katerina, we're going to move you up from um, Project Paraphilic and have you speak now because you do have a commitment that you're going to need to get to. So we've shifted you up the agenda. Yes, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, it does look like I'm not allowed to share my screen. So maybe again, just to make it quicker, if you can share it for me. Thanks, Sam. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, thanks for having me and for um, for changing the time. Uh, I'm going to be presenting really briefly the project profile in the Czech Republic. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, um, so the project profile is financed by the Ministry of Social Affairs and aims to establish um, a system of early intervention for people in increased risk of sexual offending, either towards uh, minors or towards adults. Uh, it's, uh, it's not only a primary um, preventive project, but also we, in, we intervene at um, secondary and tertiary prevention as well. Uh, we also, at the same time, we pilot a long-term therapeutic protocol, the evaluation of cost effectiveness and effectiveness of all the interventions in um, education, and, and we provide education for uh, professionals from uh, various fields, such as uh, uh, police and, and uh, social workers um, and uh, professionals in a healthcare system. So can you go to the next slide? Um, basically, we do have two uh, main target groups, uh, people with a paraphilic preference and then their close persons. Um, so who actually uh, comes to us? Uh, we do have three groups from uh, the paraphilic groups, um, self-identified uh, individuals who just seek therapeutic help and come voluntarily. Then the other group would be paraphiles who are referred from other clinicians, uh, very often sexologists, psychiatrists or psychologists. And then the, the last group are paraphiles during, uh, who are referred uh, to us during a poli police investigation or a criminal trial. Uh, we do take on clients from 16 years old, so sometimes we do have referral from school psychologists as well. And then the other important uh, group of clients are the important others to our um, to our paraphilic um, uh, clients in uh, in treatment. Also, I would just um, quickly mention that the reporting mandatory reporting law here is very similar to what Isabel reported um, in Germany. So we don't uh, have the we don't have to report any uh, past uh, crimes of that that we know of. Thanks. Next slide. Um, 
These are several intervention modes that we offer. I'll just uh, go through them very quickly. Uh, so obviously we do have a web page we launched at uh, March 2020. Uh, doesn't target any specific group. It's a uh, uh, it's very general for our potential clients, for professionals, or for media. We offer basic psychoeducation, some background stories from our clients, and we did have more than 40, 45,000 visits since we launched it. Then online counseling, uh, helpline, and face-to-face -face therapy. I'll talk about that uh, in a minute, um, and then. Uh, uh, deterrence messaging, but I think that uh, it was already mentioned in here several times, so it's very similar with us. I would just say that um, the the helpline, the face-to-face -face therapy was launched in, um, were launched in January 2021. All the services are anonymous and, and free of charge for our clients. We can go next. Um, yeah, so, so now I'll, ju I'll just describe briefly the, uh, the web counseling helpline and face-to-face. And -face. So if you, we can go to the next slide. Um, so there are, there are several ways uh, of how clients can uh, get in touch with us. One of them uh, is a direct uh, a form to contact therapy on our website. We did have uh, 52 people who asked directly for therapy. Um, and um, uh, this was since the beginning uh, of the uh, of the website. So since March 2020, they had to be on a wait list for several months till we opened the um, the face to face therapy. And here you can see the diagnostics of uh, of those clients. So the majority are people with uh, uh, pedophilia, but we also have some fetishes, sadists, etc. You can go next. Um, okay, then we do offer online counseling, uh, so people can post or clients can post their queries and uh, we answer usually within five days. Uh, we did conduct a qualitative analysis of the content and uh, we can cluster them in five groups. So the first one would be people who just want to share their feelings or are dealing with some stigma or ask about some legal framework, ethical limits to their behavior. For example, is it okay to tell my partner about my arousal from causing her pain? Uh, the other group would be people who want to uh, go to therapy to um, or want to stop, uh, uh, stop some behavior. Um, uh, for example, as we can see here, people who watch um, child pornography or uh, other other kinds of illegal pornography and just want to um, just want to stop, but don't know how. Can we go next? OK, the third group, people who seek advice about their uh, important others uh, dealing with uh, some risky uh, sexual behavior or some paraphilias. Uh, another group, people who seek education about sexuality or relationships. It's important to note that not all the questions are related to paraphilias, since um, uh, it's targeted way broader than we do have uh, many questions regarding uh, sexual, sexual dysfunctions and, and relationship uh, issues. And the last group would be just um, other, other messages. OK, so on the next slide, you can see some time trends uh, of the monthly messages uh, we are getting in uh, online counseling since the launch of the website. And as you can see, the peak in May 21 uh, that was connected to our uh, media campaign that we launched. Next. All right, a few words about the helpline. Uh, so the aim is to offer short term psychological help for people with, uh, again, with perfect interest and the important others in crisis situation. This is how we adver advertise it in, uh, on our website. We do uh, offer the services via um, telephone, Cisco, Webex, and or clients can arrange um, a face to face uh, meeting. Um, uh, yes, you can go to the next slide. We did have from so so for almost two years. Uh, we did have uh, 175 calls. Again, we uh, differentiate uh, as as uh, uh, you guys do as well from uh, from calls and callers. So uh, 109 unique callers. Um, 
important to say that we try to limit the service by only three uh, calls, then either we have to provide a referral to other services or if the client meets the criteria to enter the face-to-face -face, uh, long-term therapeutic uh, intervention, then we assess them um, to, uh, to uh, go there. Uh, out of the uh, 109 uh, callers, we had 37 clients uh, that um, that were uh, that, that that came to a diagnostic interview, and there you can see the uh, current number of uh, paraphilic clients who came through the helpline. Then some dropouts. Then also some clients with a compulsive sexual behavior disorder um, uh, that we accepted into treatment, and one significant other. On the next slide, you can see again some time trends uh, since the beginning of the helpline um, with, uh, with a total drop at the, in summer 21. That was because we had to, we had to stop the line for, for several months. And on the next slide, you can see again that we conducted a qualitative analysis of the calls, and these are uh, some of the major topics that uh, we deal with. So obviously concerns about uh, about uh, their own sexuality, there is a sexual fantasies, behavior, risky situation, but also we do get calls um, regarding um, anxiety, depression, sexual dysfunction, relationship issues, etc. So as I said, because we don't advertise it uh, just for people who are attracted uh, or who are in a risky sexual behavior, uh, but when it, we want to keep it that way because we do make referrals then to the whole country for, for other specialists. Next, please. So as I was saying, if the client meets the criteria to go on the face-to-face uh, -face treatment, we conduct a screening uh, with each client, it takes 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the main inspiration was Swedish helpline Preventel, and we gather basic sociodemographic information, and then we, uh, we conduct a basic uh, risk assessment and assessment of the well-being and also uh, potential su suicidal thoughts of the, uh, of the client. And then you can go next. Thanks. Um, so after the screening, uh, we do invite the clients for a diagnostic interview, then research assessment that involves also uh, using risk assessment, standardized risk assessment tools. And then uh, each client goes to ses two sessions, individual sessions of motivational interviewing. And then this next slide, <laughs> uh, psychoeducation. And after that, um, either group or individual therapy. Uh, we do um, sort our, our clients mm, either into group or individual therapy based on uh, the risk assessment and also um, based on a clinical decision that we make with our with our staff. Um, there's a different frequency for high high risk clients and low risk clients, so either once per week or once per two weeks. Uh, the du duration of the intervention is approximately uh, one year, and we do apply um, something that we call the client CV, which is a specific list of modules that were inspired by, by BEADED and Good Lives models, and also um, basic or CBT techniques that each client has to, has to go through. Okay, and Next is my last slide, so I'll just say my goodbyes with a quote from, from one client who um, completed a one-year therapy, uh, and he says in his evaluation uh, interview, I know I can't change that I'm a pedophile, but now I know I can manage my behavior and not be afraid to fail. So thank you very much, and thank you also for sharing my presentation and helping, helping me out. Me out. Katharina, thank you so much. And it's always difficult when someone else is doing your slides for you. So I think you did a really good job there. Um, and again, really just interesting to see the different the different trends and insights. And I found that slide that you have looked at the common themes um, really interesting. And in fact, I shot Donald a message behind the scenes saying we need to do more of that. Um, and then we can see what we're all looking at in terms of insights and trends. Um, so thank you very much. And I know you need to go shortly for a client. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, so next up, we're going to go to Finland. Um, and Nina, I can't see you. I've seen you before, but you're not currently on my screen. So Nina, uh, welcome from Protect Children in Finland. Can you see me now? I just... Uh, see your screen. Again. Yes. Yes, you're good. showing. Yes, good, you're good. good. I can see you. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, well, honored to be here today celebrating so Stop It Now 30 years of hard work. 
privilege to follow. I have been following the Stop It Now over 10 years and happy to say that we have always found great ways to collaborate. So thank you. So uh, Protect Children, we are a non-profit, non-governmental Helsinki based child rights organization working internationally with a dedicated team uh, fighting the good fight to end sexual violence against children. All our actions stem from a research based holistic method and we put into practice what we learn from our, our innovative research we conduct. So what we do. Uh, we work with research-based holistic method that kind of uh, combines six themes. We educate children, parents, professionals and of course law enforcement. We do research uh, on sexual violence against children. We support victims and their families and amplify the voices and wisdom of survivors. We analyze child sexual abuse material in Project Arachnet led by the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. Uh, we have analyzed uh, over 1.1 million images and through our work there has been approximately 800,000 notice and takedown requests uh, through Project Arachnet. Through our research we know that the fast actions to take down child sexual abuse material is really effective way to prevent sexual crimes against children. Uh, as if you read our research report, uh, you can clearly see. But most importantly, of course, it gives hope to victims whose images are distributed online. With our strong awareness, as an advocacy work, we demand concrete actions from duty bearers and policymakers that the rights of the child are respected, especially online. Last but not least, our offender focused prevention measures that I'm going to tell you more right now. For years, I have witnessed a huge increase uh, uh, of distribution and and uh, use of child sexual abuse material and all forms of online sexual crimes against children. Even there has been strong attempts to prevent these crimes. Unfortunately, nothing has managed to turn to tie. Uh, as psychotherapist, I work with victims of child sexual abuse and their families. And of course, years of analyzing child sexual abuse material, I'm extremely motivated and dedicated to find ways to stop crimes in the first place before a child becomes a victim of sexual violence and that is what uh, Stop It Now is, is all about of course. Uh, with our offender focused prevention and redirection project funded by End Violence, we have been able to gather information from the child sexual abuse material users and we have developed a CBD based self-help program focusing only uh, to those who use uh, illegal material. Our goal is to support behavioral chains and to stop the users viewing and distribution CSAM. So build what you believe. <laughs> so we did. We innovated two surveys into the dark web, help us to help you and no need for help. We had two goals. First, to gather more knowledge for crime prevention and second to understand the pathways to criminal behavior. So when someone is searching. Uh, oh, whoops. <laughs> so if, if someone is searching for illegal material with three dark web search engines with specific acronyms or or codes, they will be redirected and offered our research links, global EU help links as well as our our redirects and self-help program. Our intervention really worked. More than 340,000 individuals have been clicking into our surveys and we have gathered uh, over 21,000 answers globally uh, in 21 languages. Uh, so these are the individuals who are actively searching and using illegal child sexual abuse material and they are out there uh, and they also groom children as our research clearly uh, stated. Uh, please visit our webpage for more information but here are just some uh, key findings. Uh, we got two quite shocking results. First we are talking about children. Responders uh, to our survey say that they've been exposed to this material as young as 13. 
percent under 18 and secondly they are not only viewing and and this is something we need to really focus nearly uh, 40 percent say they contact children after viewing and almost 60 percent say they are afraid that their CSAM use might lead them to sexual offences against children. 60 percent it is. We also found some risk factors that you are able to find from our uh, uh, academic research. Uh, those who use child sexual abuse material more frequently, those who watch child sexual abuse material depicting young children, toddlers and infants, those who are in contact with other CSAM users. So, with all this knowledge, we developed a manualized CBT redirection program in collaboration with psychologists and psychotherapists working in the field. It's based on our research, research results uh, and manualized program, uh, new direction, uh, kind of uh, already used in Finnish and Estonian prisons. Uh, that's a manualized program based on also CBD based. Uh, redirection program can be used anonymously both in the open and dark web and it is uh, it's now available in English and Spanish. Uh, it's hosted uh, by Helsinki University Hospital and there has been over 70,000 visits to the program since its launch. And of course, we evaluate, we have got positive feedback from our redirection uh, program. Its scalability was evaluated by global experts and we got good results. It has been also evaluated by, by professionals uh, uh, here in Finland, uh, as well as from the users. So we are uh, translating now the redirection program into new languages together with our project partners and other collaboration uh, partners as well. Uh, so uh, there will be more language versions as well. So uh, a quote like, like I, I been seeing that everybody has a quote, but I think that tells more than the thousands of, of, of explanations. And we think that our program is a good example of low cost preventive measures uh, from where we are able to guide people to face to face services like stop it now. So we, we don't start to treat anyone uh, which just uh, we are the first step and we push people to the stop it now services all over the world. Of course, more more evaluation is needed, but uh, we are able to uh, if kind of if we can do something we want to do it. Even one individual, if, if we, quite often he stops using child sexual abuse material, it makes a world of difference, especially those children whose images of sexual abuse and exploitation are shared online. So what next? Uh, we are part of the EU funded offender focused prevention projects, uh, for example, 2PS and Bridge, uh, the Christopher uh, uh, team is, is, is leading. And just stating uh, kind of, uh, we are starting the strong collaboration at the EU level as well. Uh, so there will be more projects uh, focusing on the offender based prevention. And what we are going to do with our redirection project. Uh, that is ongoing still, we are going to publish a new and extremely interesting research report in January, uh, thanks to our head of research, Tegan Insel, who is, who is also joining this expert meeting, uh, as well uh, as our junior researcher, uh, Valeria Soloveva. So we have analyzed both qualitative and quantitative data from 1,500 Russian language responders. Uh, so here is just some some small uh, results and and unfortunate uh, these results kind of say that help seeking behavior uh, of course that is very understandable if we are talking about Russian speaking uh, people uh, they are not seeking help uh, so that's that's a bit bad sign of course uh, and then again uh, they are younger uh, the first exposure has been uh, different than the global data. So stay tuned and subscribe to our newsletter. It's in English so you can you can understand it. It's not in Finnish. 
and and kind of thank you stop it now 30 years it's just amazing uh, all your hard work to protect children your work makes makes a difference every single day so so let's continue our collaboration and and let's make this world better and safer for every child thank you yeah, yeah. thank you nina um put so eloquently in the end there um exactly what we're doing and why we're here and why we need to work together um, continuously. Some really fascinating stuff there and research that you've got going on. Um, there was something you mentioned that picked up my ears though, this low cost, low cost intervention measures, and that that's really important that we we bear in mind those sorts of considerations about what what is what is low cost, what is high cost, what is what is scalable, um, and then and then yeah, sharing the learning from all of that really really important. Thank you, Nina. Now, um, next up on the agenda, we have Eve from SIDS in Canada, but I don't think uh, he's made the meeting, but I do think he has provided a recording that we're going to play, which I don't think is actually him. So <laughs> provided by him, he couldn't make it, but it's someone else in it is my understanding. So it's all a bit of a surprise. Um, so Sam, if you're ready, I think we can go ahead and, and play that unless I'm mistaken and he has just suddenly joined the call. Let me know if you can't hear it. Or... Thanks, Sam. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to the Stop It Now birthday party. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Julie Simono, and I am, I am a criminologist and a member of the SASUFI team. And uh, I'm going to briefly introduce you to uh, SASUFI services. So I'm going to start by telling you about the origin of the Sasuke project and uh, how we came to be more aware of the idea of prevention in terms of uh, sexual delinquency. So I would like to introduce our current team. So uh, Yves Paradi, sexologist, psychotherapist and director of the Intervention Center in Sexual Delinquency in Laval, Quebec. Um, myself, Julie Simono, criminologist and coordinator of services at the ICSD in Laval. And uh, Pauline Delphini and Clara Audouin, both criminologists at the ICSD in Laval, Quebec, Canada. So the starting point for uh, the Sasuke project is that as you probably know, a large proportion of sexual offences are not reported to the police, which means that many people act out without the judicial system being aware of it. It is also noticeable that interventions for problematic sexual behaviour are always done after the drama or after the, the act. So you see, it's as if we had to wait until there was an offense and therefore victims before we could deal with the problem, whereas the demand exists. So there are, as researchers have pointed out in a few studies, people who had sexual fantasies about minors, but who have never acted out and who have recently not received any help. And I, I must also point out that there are projects in uh, Europe on the pre prevention of sexual delinquency, not only Stop It Now in the United Kingdom, but uh, also in Germany with the uh, Dunkelfeld project, uh, also in Belgium with uh, Theos, or in Switzerland with Dilo. In Quebec, uh, Canada, uh, in 2020, there was uh, an expert report uh, on sexual violence that made uh, several recommendations, two of which were that non-judicialized people receive services and that an anonymous and confidential helpline be created for people who have committed or are at risk of committing acts of sexual violence. 
So I will now tell you about some important dates in connection with our collaboration with Stop It Now. First of all, I want to warmly thank uh, the Stop It Now team for allowing us to translate their modules and to work with them. Um, so firstly, we had our first contact with Mr. Stuart Alardis, uh, or Alardis, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, on June 25, uh, 2020. And then we received the, the permission to translate the models on August 5, uh, 2020. In October 2020, we started translating the models and researching for our helpline and website. And finally, on June 7, 2021, uh, the helpline was opened as well as the website and we launched the English, English chat and the website in January 2022. Now I will present you the services offered by uh, Sassy. Well, <clears throat> Sassy is for people experiencing emotional suffering related to sexual fantasies about minors or any other type of fantasy, of sexual fantasy. Um, the mission is to provide support services in order to reduce the distress experienced by these people and to prevent sexual offenses. To sum up, uh, there is a civil, severe sorry, lack of preventive services for sexual offenses even though the demand is there. So the collaboration with Stop It Now allowed us to set up our project in Quebec, Canada. And we thank them once again. And this project, uh, the Sassuti project, is also largely inspired by the Dunkelfeld project in Germany. Uh, concerning the guidelines, concerning the values of SACIFI, the values adopted by SACIFI are the guidelines for the work of each and every volunteer, but are also the skills with which we help our clients. And SACIFI has several values like privacy, like is, uh, SACIFI is there to listen in complete confidentiality, respecting professional secrecy. Uh, there's also open-mindedness. Uh, Sassufi is there to be empathetic and non-judgmental about what callers have to say. Uh, respect. Uh, Sassufi is committed to giving the callers all the consideration they deserve in, in order to help them deal with their sexual problems, whatever they may be. And last but not least, integrity and rigor. Uh, forestness and integrity enable to help callers with accuracy, honesty, and impartiality. Concerning the services, <coughs> the services we offer with Sassufi are threefold. First, the helpline. Uh, it's uh, open uh, Monday to Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it's the same for the chat. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, the chat is available since January 2022, uh, whereas the helpline is available since June 2021. And we have also the website with uh, self-help models and it's uh, available at all times, and uh, it's uh, available uh, since June 2021. Okay, so I uh, apologize in advance because the, the graphs could not be translated into English, but I will explain them to you so that it is as clear as possible for you. So in terms of the number of calls on the helpline since June 2021. Depending on the type of caller, uh, we notice that we have a lot of men calling us 
Uh, for your information, orange columns uh, represent male calls and blue columns represent female calls. <clears throat> we had a lot of calls between uh, January and June 2022, but slightly less uh, after July 2022. Um, this can be explained by the fact that the line received several calls per month uh, from the same person, so we, uh, which may explain the number uh, of calls. <laughs> As for the purpose of the calls, uh, we note that 58% uh, of callers who call for sexological disorders uh, such as uh, compulsive masturbation or pervasive sexual fantasies, which are not necessarily unacceptable. And we also see the, uh, that almost 10% uh, in blue uh, on the graph a call for sexual interest uh, towards minors. About the reason for the chat request now, uh, on chat you can see that 14 applicants or 37% of the applications on the chat were for sexual interest uh, in minors and that's most of the requests uh, for, for the chat. Uh, this can be explained by the fact that this is a taboo interest, um, as you may know, and um, that it can be too confrontational. Uh, I don't know if uh, that's the correct word, but uh, you know, it's uh, confronting for the people uh, to talk about it um, verbally, orally over the phone. And uh, also seven requests were for sexological disorders. For the age of uh, the applicants for chat, <clears throat> it is noted that the majority are, uh, are adults, but uh, some represent uh, teenagers. Uh, so you can see uh, in orange represent um, the adults and the blue color represents uh, teenagers. Uh, as, as you can uh, imagine, the chat needs to get better known so we can have more requests. Finally, uh, we see that the most used models are those of the first model, uh, including understanding, sorry, uh, understanding fantasies, sexual fantasies, and why they have this kind of fantasy. Well, uh, I thank you all for listening and I hope I spoke English well enough for you to understand me. Uh, I thank Stop It Now again and wish you a happy birthday. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. And uh, we will pass our thanks on electronically, um, but we're going to swiftly move on because I've just seen a message exchange between Wayne and Donald. So Wayne, if you are ready, we're coming to you now. Yes, that's great. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Is that OK? Yeah, they're great. Let me get the slides up. Uh, OK, can you see those or not? I've got my slides up. Can you see those? Something's no. just coming. Something's oh. just not. It's just a white screen at the moment. Oh. Don't no, just a white screen, Wayne. Well, I clicked on the button and it's not working. Uh, Matthew's there too. We did send you the slides. I don't know if you have a copy. If you're able to get your hand on those to send them up for us. I hope this isn't a punishment because we beat you in the football in the World <laughs> Cup. I've got my theory about this. <laughs> Absolutely not, Twain. Absolutely not. Let's go. Thank you. Go. Okay, thanks. Matthew, do you want to start? Yeah, no, just say a few words to thank you, all of you, and uh, just a happy birthday to Lucy Faithful and stop it now. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, everybody. I'm sorry I'm quite busy right now. I just lots of work, you know, from the Montpellier University Hospital, and I let Wayne talking because they have lost. So now it's your turn to play, Wayne. <laughs> See you very soon. Take care. Yeah. Matthew, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so this is the, um, uh, I, uh, we worked together in a, a group called the CREABS here in France. We were formed in 2009. It's uh, essentially psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, I think there's 220 people across the whole of the country. We'll come back to a slide which will look at that. We are working in the forensic psychiatric department of a major uh, teaching hospital. In this area, we cover a population of about 1,100,000 people. So it's fairly large, you know, it gives us a big section. Um, if I move on to the next slide, please. Is that me? Okay, great. Um, so we we are looking at uh, primary, uh, secondary and tertiary um, prevention. Uh, that's part of the work we're doing. Um, and so we're looking at um, uh, those three areas which are absolutely essential for the work we're doing. The next slide, please. As I mentioned, the, the French Federation of Resource Centres for Workers with Perpetrators of Sexual Violence is the French association of these professionals and our objective is to improve the prevention, understanding and management of sexual violence on the basis of ethical and practical reflection. You can see the arrow, we're down here in the Mediterranean uh, in France, but you can see this, uh, I think there's 27 centres throughout the country, including the overseas territories in the, um, for example, in the uh, uh, Le Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, the Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean and, and Corsica as well, of course. Next slide, please. We have in France that there are uh, uh, these these um, centres that we have, the CREABS group. Um, we are basically have uh, six missions uh, which are given to us to network and to form a network of other all professionals working in this area who are touched by it. And as many of you have already mentioned, you know, it's contacting contact with the police, social services. Um, uh, 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 and any group, in fact, who are working with um, uh, sexual violence in, in its forms. Information, uh, transmitting that, documentation, keeping across what's happening, latest research. We are, as I've mentioned, we are a university, we're in university teaching hospitals, and so research is essential, it's part of what we do. It's one of the uh, uh, missions that we have. Professional support as well amongst each other, and prevention, as I've already mentioned, I guess you can put all of that under care. Next slide, please. So um, we're looking at how uh, we're looking at this prevention, the primary tertiary, so primary, we're talking at the, from a universal point of view. The, the secondary, we're looking at targeting uh, what we're doing in prevention. And uh, if we look at our next slide, please. We launched as well, inspired by, by Stop It Now uh, and, and Congratulations and happy birthday. Uh, our, our helpline is simply called STOP. It's a national helpline. It's free um, for uh, people who are attracted, uh, minor attracted people. Um, we um, were funded, we are funded by the French National Health Service. And uh, we've, we had, uh, and we were really happy to welcome Donald in Paris uh, in July this year, when we had uh, um, a day um, where we had international um, French speaking, uh, essentially, uh, uh, participants. And uh, we put together, um, we were trying to find out what the research was, what's happening on the helplines, a bit like we're sharing today. And we came up as well with a, an international charter, a code, which we asked everybody to sign, where everybody participated in, the, in putting this together. And we have eight principles for, the, for which uh, we are all in agreement. For example, the first principle, the suffering person, the, the, the victim is at the center of our concerns. And we develop that. And the second principle, listening is offered in a neutral, non-judgmental and is not a commercial activity, um, being there, therapy, etc. for these people. So give you some ideas of what we're looking at. The next slide, please. So uh, we also look at selective uh, um, uh, tertiary prevention, and this is where we're trying to say what, what else needs to be done. And we thought, well, let's look at what's happening uh, and what's available in terms of uh, prevention. Next slide, please. 
we decided as part of our prevention mission without reinventing the wheel um, our team set, it, set out to create a very simple and functional SGBV prevention toolkit, which we called the boat, uh, which means in, uh, it's from the French, le boîte à outils de prévention. It's a very ambitious project, and it's the first project of its kind uh, in the French-speaking world anyway, which goes from uh, five years, five-year-olds to 18 years old, and we cover all types of violence including sexual or sexist behavior. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. We uh, structured it according to the various stages of psychosexual and emotional development of children. It had to be easy to use and it requires no special equipment. In any way, it can be used every, all over the place. Occasionally, it can be used as integratively, it can be repeated, it can be a graduated use. It's something which can be used by people as they wish. It's very easily adaptable. It's directly uh, linked to the ecological environment of professionals and available for all environments, in fact. Evidence-based, and this was absolutely fundamental. We identified in the beginning more than 800 prevention programs. And we said to ourselves, do they work? Do they work? Uh, you know, show me the evidence. It's a very simple question. And none of them, none of them, not one, had any research based on it. We said, this is just not possible. Uh, we believe that if it doesn't work, then drop it. Let's do something else and find something that is effective. So that was important. Um, we wanted something that was relevant as well for primary, secondary and tertiary sexual gender based violence prevention. And we wanted to involve all professionals who work with children, and that includes parents. So we wanted to, you see, we're very ambitious, we're very large, but we thought, yeah, we can be done. Our next slide, please. So our methodology was the following. We did, we did this census uh, on the internet of every single French tool and program for sexual gender-based violence prevention for about 2010, 2011. We then did a selection and validation by an expert group. We categorized what we thought needed to be done, uh, talking with experts from all over the place, from the education uh, ministry, from, uh, from teachers, from nurses, from schools, from, from parents groups. We went all over the place. Um, we then set up the design and the creation of the boat briefcase, uh, which we call it, uh, in 2016. I think it weighs something like three kilos. It's pretty heavy. In its, uh, John will see it. It's a huge thing. Um, but then we've also, so we, we, we set up, started putting up training uh, for that. In 2017, we started that launching the training. We then created the digital version of it because what we realized, why we did the hard version, we wanted also for it to be used if necessary in places like Africa. Uh, many French country, speaking countries in Africa that don't have internet access very easily, etc. India contacted us, other countries. So we're looking at that as well. Our next, please. Um, we looked at the feasibility uh, throughout the process of creating the boat and implementing it by multiplying tests with different populations. So we looked, you know, we tested it in nurseries, in primary, secondary, middle school students, but also with minors, with uh, young children, uh, young people, sorry, with disabilities, um, people who were placed in, in uh, uh, secure settings, people who were hospitalized, uh, prison situations. So we tested it all over the place to see if it worked or not. Was it acceptable? We were able to test this project uh, with partners from different audiences and sites, and the acceptability was good for the workers, for parents, and for the kids. So we said, this is good. We, the a study from the University of Toulouse was carried out to assess the educational processes for the acquisition of the skills that we wanted to, to transmit and for them to, to adapt and to take on board. And the efficiency was also something important. We validated each intervention with regard to our proposed objectives. Each of the activity sheets that we have has been tested with focus groups. So to affirm that it satisfies the very strict criteria that was laid down for the evaluation. The next slide, please. 
So it's, it is, uh, uh, there's a sort of boat effect, if I can say like that, uh, a prospective multi-center randomized interventional study was then put into place. So the CRIAVS LR, that's us, we, we kicked it off down here uh, in Montpellier in the south of France. Um, and two people were trained for each of the groups that you can see with our colleagues in other regions within France. Um, and then we looked at secondary school inclusions, 10 to 14 secondary schools who are going to be recruited by the CRIAVS. And we were then looking at uh, schools that were would have the, the um, training and the, the schools that wouldn't have training, for example. And then we examined afterwards, were there, was there an increase in disciplinary measures, in, in violent acts, etc., with the group that had the training or the group that didn't have the training? Was there a difference? And our initial research is saying there's a huge difference. It's having an impact. So that's very interesting uh, from what we're doing. Next slide, please. So we have various project materials that we that we use. As I said, there's this. The, it's actually uh, uh, weighs about three kilos. This the, all these sheets that we have, but it's also digitally available with videos, with with access to stuff. But it's very interactive, and people have to be trained. You couldn't just simply pick it up. It wouldn't make sense on its own. There is a training. I think it's a three day training uh, that we we um, put with this, and uh, it's. It's been taken up um, because it works. Uh, the next slide, please. So as you say, we, we have users, we have trainers, we're recycling, we train people to retrain people. So we'll train teachers who will then train other teachers. That's the whole idea behind this. Parents will then create a group to train other parents once they've been things. We're using the cloud, the briefcase, we're using Intervision, we're using all the different things like we're using today, uh, uh, Teams or, 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 or whatever the, the, the base is. Well, the research, of course, is very important, uh, which is the GEESE uh, research project that we're doing. Training courses, collaboration, a newsletter, a website, and all that's been put in place. And we now have uh, somebody dealing with that. The briefcase has 134 activity sheets with a game board, a facilitator guide, information, letters for parents, school cards, etc. And all this information is available, as I say, uh, in a digital format, which has been really successful. Next slide, please. The challenges and the, ne and the next steps for us is the formalization of partnerships for training for users and for trainers. And of course, for the use of the boat, we call it the boat because it works well. Uh, translation of the boat is now being done in English, in Arabic and in Spanish. We went to the Lebanon and uh, the Lebanese wanted to use it in Arabic. So we had a great time there uh, talking to colleagues and training them there. The Spanish too. There's a prospective research now uh, on the boat effects within the schools, as I've mentioned. And that's something that we need to, we're developing uh, furthermore. So it's a real development of the international community in real time and in digital of this prevention uh, programs and of the people that are using it. Next slide, please. Our dearest wish, of course, is to share all this information. The object of what we're doing, we're, uh, we're uh, I say we're public health workers in a sense, we, we want to reduce the number of children that suffer sexual abuse, aggression in any form. So that's what we're looking at. We, we developed that. You've got our contacts there. And our last slide, please. Let's work together. Uh, if you're interested, uh, this is some of the team, uh, my colleagues here. Uh, Matthew's address is there, his email address. We believe that being working together makes us stronger uh, and we're so happy to, to share and to, to continue this work, which is really important. Let's be honest, it's a major health issue, public health issue, and it's not going away. 
put it in context, we were also invited, you may have heard in the Catholic Church last year, we published a report, 330,000 victims of just within the Catholic Church within France. We are in part of another um, independent uh, commission by the French government. They put up their, their, their heading that there's a judge in charge of this who has already identified 134,000 children every year victims of incest. That's the big one, the family. And that's what we're now, our research, we're concentrating there as well. This is the, it's society, isn't it? Uh, and the figures are just absolutely amazing uh, and frightening and at the same token we know that uh, and let's do something about it we can prevent prevention is the key prevention works I'll thank stop you, we, do treat, we do treat people <laughs> as well <laughs> <laughs> thank you Wayne thank you so much it's a really interesting model you've got there with the network um so that was really fascinating to hear about and also terribly ambitious um so a man after Donald's heart no doubt um so thank you so much and hopefully whoever's waiting for you is waiting very patiently thank you. um so now, last but not least, uh, Hakim from Disno and Diego from Before More, both in Switzerland. Um, and I can see you both, the first people yeah. today I've actually been able to see. Um, so <laughs> welcome, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll try to share uh, my desktop to do the presentation. I hope it wor works. Um, do you guys see anything? Got a black not screen. Yet. Black. Blank. Okay. Ah, ah. Is it Just, there? Yes, yes. Perfect. Um, so, um, thanks for the invitation. Um, we are very happy that we can uh, present um, our services here in Switzerland. Um, also, from the last words we just heard, I think it's very important to raise awareness. It's a very important topic and we are really wanting to work to um, have some specific interventions in this field. It's very important to collaborate. Um, this presentation, um, it's from Dino and before more. So we tried to um, do one presentation as our collaboration is very important to us. And also thanks to Donald who already mentioned that we are willing to collaborate also closely uh, with Stop It Now with the community. Um, it's great to hear um, all the news from the projects. It's very inspiring what's happening right now. So I would like to present our organizations briefly. Um, Dino has a little bit longer history than, well, uh, quite longer history than before more. It was founded in 1995 in the French region. Um, Switzerland has, those who know, has 26 provinces. Um, and yes, we have um, four official languages. Um, one, one is, the big one is uh, French and German. Those, those are kind of two biggest languages. Um, Dino, as you see, has started with prevention work um, in 2014. They have quite some experience. You will also will be reflected by the numbers um, they have, the services they provide. Before more is more focused on the German regions, um, but again, we try to have like a concept for um, Switzerland. Um, because that's very important to us and doing so we also work in close collaboration with the government, the federal government in Switzerland. Um, before more, it was founded in 2020 um, and started with this oper operational work in 21. Um, I won't go into details about um, what exactly we do it's more about an overview of the services i think otherwise we will have um I mean you heard already a lot about services other countries do and uh working when we work in this field i think we do quite similar um similar we have quite a similar process um our services, um, we are working in the prevention field and we provide counseling if in the areas of 
um, potential pedophilia, hebephilia, or uh, in general, child abuse, that topic. Um, as you can see, we have, um, like, we want to improve child protection in Switzerland. That's like our main goal. Um, we have like those three target groups. Uh, first target group, um, I think that's the main bigger one. Um, you can see that in the middle, the main pillar. Um, it's um, those people who notice that they um, have some fantasies, for example, about minors. Um, there we are open to them. They can call us, they can contact us through email or um, we also have like a, a form on our website. Um, we try to do everything as anonymous as, pos as pos possible. Um, the second pillar is about the relatives. I think that's a very important part because um, working in the field, we also have noticed that um, relatives at times they have difficulties to find some help. Um, there are sadly also in Switzerland, there are not many services who provide specific help, especially in this field. Um, that's why it's very important to us to also give them some um some space where they can just talk about their their worries where they can um, get some answers um also in a anonymous way and the last part of course is um the professionals um because i think you have the similar experiences in other countries too that yes we have many professionals for example doctors who or in, in hospitals where they um, work on topics of sexuality, but when it's more about um, paraphilias, then um, at times um, services get to their boundaries. They don't, um, they at times struggle to give some, uh, to provide some specific interventions. And there we also try to consult as far as we can. Um, by saying so, I think it's very important also to know that um, I mentioned we do our our offers are anonymous. They are also free of charge. We try to be as in independent as possible. What we don't do that's very important also for that differs maybe that's kind of a different differentiation between other projects that exist also in other countries. We don't provide um, psychotherapeutic interventions and not an in-depth risk assessment or diagnostics. And we are no emergency service. Um, I think there, again, it's very important also for us that other services, for example, in Switzerland are existing, which could cover those topics be better than we do. Um, for example, when we um, have someone from a target group and they're in the first reading, it's already clear that someone needs a more specific intervention. Um, when you look also at risk need responsivity, that there is more need, there is a higher risk, then of course we try to motivate them so they go to a specific um, therapeutic institution. Um, there it's also important to us that we um, assist them in that process and that we make sure that this um, kind of referral is happening and they uh, receive the help they seek. Contact op options, I already mentioned, it's through telephone, email, face-to-face -face interview. Honestly, at Before More, we have a lot of face-to-face -face interviews. Um, I'm quite surprised that people don't really contact us yet from um, on our website or the contact form, which is kind of an anon anonymous. They more often just try to um, come in and have an interview one by one. Um, I already mentioned that, yes, the Swiss government, we are very glad that they see that there is a lot of potential and there is a need to address um, this topic, it's very important also to 
prevent um, further um, damage in the society. Um, so we have a long-term financial support from the government and we are also funded by foundations and um, in the future years already now some prov provincial financial support is happening and we think that in the future that will um, that will happen even more so. Um, we collaborate, as I already mentioned, with um, specialized therapeutic centers. That's very, a very important part to us. Uh, we have the connections with law enforcement, uh, with support groups and other professionals. Um, I think it's very important and I think also the meeting today shows it's very important to share experiences um, and to learn from each other and especially to also have common standards in this field. That's a very important part to us. Um, if I talk about standards, I think it's also important to know just before from um, the project Kriafs um, was mentioned the standards that they signed and Dino um, also signed those standards. Um, just briefly, about numbers from before more. Um, yes, we are not operational since a long time and um, the advertising campaign or awareness campaign will start next year. Um, so we are kind of like in a similar situation like Stop It Now in Brussels. Um, but uh, we had, even without campaign, we already had quite some contacts um, yeah, we have um, several projects um, already planned and uh, yes, there is this difficulty because the, the factor of yuck factor was mentioned. Yes, that has an impact also in Switzerland. Um, so we really try to raise awareness with the provinces and get more support to also have implement some bigger projects in the future. We'll see how it continues. And I think at this point, I would like to um, give the, the, um, the presentation to Hakim, because he's also here. Yes. And he would take yes. over and mention something from the part of Dino. Yeah, um, I hope it can works. Can you please? Uh, um, Should I do the presentation? Show, show the slides, please. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, yes. So, uh, so a few numbers for for Dino. So, um, just to mention, we have uh, so far this year um, almost uh, two hundred uh, requests from. Uh, coming from 64 persons. That's uh, concerning the minor attracted persons, so the, the main um, the target group. Um, regarding relatives, we have uh, 37 requests coming from 17 person, and um, also um, coming from 20 years old and under, we have had uh, so far this year uh, 19, we've been in contact with 19 people. So what we, we've been noticing uh, is that um, the last two years uh, we have a large increase of uh, requests uh, plus 30 per percent between 2020 and 2021 and same um, between those last two years. So really uh, a lot of um, um, increase. So thank you, uh, thank you, Diego. Um, regarding the, the the coming projects that we we have at the moment, so as Diego was mentioning, we've been uh, noticing uh, the lack of support for relatives and lack of uh, um, yeah offers. So we uh, decided. At Dino and then to associate with the before more to uh, create um, a support group for relatives of people who've been uh, arrested for viewing CSAM. 
So um, the main uh, objectives here uh, will be to mitigate social isolation and stigmata by contamination, because we know that um, relatives from uh, uh, minor attracted persons um, also suffer uh, so social uh, isolation. Um, so, and, and we notice that there are recurring problems that are, that are presenting to them, and so that we decided to to offer specific support for this target group. And um, we also have noticed the uh, increase of uh, requests coming from young people. So at the moment, we want to offer a new accessible and free of charge one-on-one -on -one counseling um, um, offer for teenagers and young adults. Uh, and we are working in um, collaboration with uh, several uh, uh, forensic psychologists who will create the program and we will uh, host this program at Dino. Um, hopefully, uh, already at the end of next year or in 24. So um, that's where we're at at the moment with the new projects. We always try to work in close collaboration with our uh, colleagues at Before More and sh always share ideas when we uh, develop new, new projects and, and take their feedback and uh, um, we, we, we do, we, we proceed like this in, uh, on both sides. So, um, for the future, uh, there is also, thank you, Diego, can you please show the next slide, thanks. So, for the future, uh, as uh, already Donald and uh, Diego mentioned, we are on the ongoing uh, reflection on um, adopting the, um, the brand of uh, Stop It Now. And um, for our national structure, at the moment we are uh, we we are supported by the uh, federal government in funding uh, a new coordinating structure at the national level. And for that structure, we would um, uh, adopt the form a new entity um, and uh, borrow the name of our, uh, Stop It Now. So um, at also, in close co collaboration with uh, um, Beformo, I, I must say that there is an, an ongoing reflection about uh, improving, uh, for example, data collection process inside the organization and how we would share it. And also, um, we um, always try to identify um, best practices in the different common, common areas we cover. So there's a lot going on. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but that, that was simply to give a, an overview of our activities and, and projects uh, at this point. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Hakim and Diego, for that. And, and to end on such a positive note, actually, in terms of future work and where, where you're heading, um, that's really exciting. Also, just to flag up the importance there where you spoke about relatives. Today, we've been talking a lot about um, intervening with abusers and potential abusers, but a huge amount of work is required for the family and friends um, of those who commit offences. So um, I know there is actually a parallel meeting ongoing in the UK about that ex exactly now. It's probably just finished. Um, right, we've only got a few minutes left, so it's not going to surprise anyone. We're not going into breakout rooms because um, we're not going to keep you any longer than that. And I thought I would just reflect on a couple of the themes that seem to have come up quite a bit throughout this morning. And then Donald, give you a minute and maybe just ask the room if there's anything anyone wants to share. But certainly for me, some of the themes that have come through is about collaboration, working together, sharing common standards, um, and that 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 cross fertilization of knowledge. Um, other themes around challenges of research and evidence based work, and also evidence based campaigns. Um, some thought around where this work sits in terms of the health agenda and criminal justice, and different approaches in different nations, and how that works. Um, another thing that I heard quite a bit was how we reach our audience. So that's through campaigns, publicity, marketing, deterrence, messaging, and what we're all learning about that um, and how we can learn from each other about what works um, in terms of reaching our audiences. And then finally, um, just a bit about society's thought, 
thoughts on, on views of this work, if you like, and making it acceptable for abusers and potentials to seek help um, and intervene at an early stage. Um, so that's a really quick summary of themes and thoughts from, from what I heard today. Donald, do you want to add anything? Bear in mind, you've got minutes, not um, hours. Thank you. <laughs> what are you saying? Um, <laughs> hey, look, uh, I'm so in awe of everything that's been presented. It's so such a delight. And I'm sorry, it is also utterly frustrating to compress everything that everyone's doing into such small windows of time and to want to dig out so much more from each one. But uh, yes, but that was the dilemma, that was the challenge. And I hope um, that the inspiration and encouragement that we can draw from each other um, is also very apparent. Uh, and that this is the beginning. This is not an end of anything. We, we, we all have a responsibility to what we do next with this, um, with how do we collaborate, with how do we share data, um, how do we, encourage each other's resources and um, how do we prop each other up and uh, and make sure that we're all using whatever evidence of effectiveness uh, that we can bring to the table so um so um this is it's, it's been a delight to me to witness um all that people have had to say um and you can expect to have some communication from us partly yes to evaluate of course um but but also partly to encourage a momentum um as to what we will could do next together going forward. You gather I'm in dialogue with uh, colleagues from Switzerland about Stop It Now as a national umbrella for the services there. I'm in dialogue with uh, the Czech Republic with uh, 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 about, about the very fact of how do we collect data? What's the platforms we're using for, an, uh, for, for storing data from our helplines? And, and I think I, I have a solution as to what we're doing, but that doesn't mean it's the best one. Other people on this screen will have better ones, perhaps. So the more we share, the more efficient, more effective, the more encouraged we can be. But we are in a challenging terrain. We have lots to do, but I think we're doing a lot already and we should be encouraged by that. So, um, uh, but any final comments from other people, um, uh, apart from the fact you're gonna hear from us uh, on Stop It Now UK and Ireland, uh, for sure. Uh, any, any final comments from one or two people uh, before we close down? Anybody? Jen, thank you for sharing all these projects, research and data combined with the real life stories of how we're all making a difference. It needs to be shared and amplified. Quite right, Jen. OK, thank I think you, I'll... Donald. Uh, Nina. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say thank you, Donald. And we all know why we are doing this. We are doing this for keeping the children safe. So excellent work uh, absolutely excellent work Donald yeah thanks Nina okay I'm going to wrap us up now then with just some final thank yous thank you all for coming across various time zones at different times of the day night morning and afternoon thank you to everyone who spoke and I uh, all the presentations which were really fascinating thank you to Francesca and Sam behind the scenes for pulling the tech together and assisting yeah. with with setting up today and a final thank you to Donald for challenging us all to cram so much in in the time frame he gave us <laughs> um, so yeah thank you everybody and we will be in touch and have very good days, nights, whatever time of day it is for you. And we will speak again soon. And happy Thank Christmas. Thank you, everybody. Oh, happy yeah, and Christmas. happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you a lot. You. Bye. Bye. Bye, Ainsley. Bye-bye, Nina. Wayne. Everybody. Everybody. Goodbye, everybody.